Welcome. Welcome to episode 52 of In Class with Carr. Dr. Greg Carr is here. I'm here. And hey, family from all over the world, wherever you are hailing, thank you for joining us. The largest Africana studies classroom in the world. The biggest classroom in the world. world. You, start, you started that. You started that, Carr. It just occurred to me. Professor Hunter, we I think maybe not even Africana studies. This might I think this is the biggest live classroom anywhere I know of. Well, we get several thousand people together and over 10 or so in over the course of our time together on a Saturday. Like I, I'm not aware of any place. Okay. Well, the largest classroom in the world. Okay. Let's, let's just call Poland, it Poland, like Switzerland, Sweet in Africa, the, the the Caribbean, London, everywhere. Love you. Everybody, love y'all. All right. So today I, I, I started last night watching the Billy Holiday piece on Hulu that uh, Lee Daniels produced and directed. Um, and I just want to give a warm shout out to and Andra Day. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. She did that. She took my breath away. Um, mm, her debut. Uh, I, I want to thank Lee Daniels, too, because I did not know this story of Billy Holiday. Of course, we all know the Strange Fruit story. Um, and we're going to talk about that today. I, you, because of you, I started, you You typed to me, you texted me, amend on Netflix. So I started watching that, went down that rabbit hole this morning. Thank you. Somebody asked us in the uh, in, 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 in Twitter, right, on social media, where oh, we're going to yeah. talk about amend. So that drove us. You know how I am about those documentaries. So. Yeah. Yeah. And this was legal. So this is in your belly wick as well, right in your wheelhouse. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. And I want to talk a little, just a smidge, not about Megyn Kelly, but about the need to not, um, you know, Lorie Daniel Favors has said on my show, you know, what we're doing in America is akin to the, the uh, Jewish people sending their children to a Nazi school. Yeah, by we, by we you mean black people. Black people. Yes. And, and while we're in Black History Month, all throughout the country, parents and, and folk are mad, white, so-called white-facing people are angry that their children have to learn about the contributions of Black people. And this being the last weekend of Black History Month, I thought it would be important to address that towards the end. But uh, did you watch the Andre Day uh, performance in that Billy Holiday and the FBI? The FBI I, did. I did. I think the acting was the strongest thing about it. Susan, Susan Laurie Parks, uh, the sister uh, who wrote the uh, screenplay, the great playwright, I guess still after watching it, my, my favorite Susan Laurie Parks adaptation for the screen remains uh, Spike Lee's Girl Six, uh, if y'all haven't seen it. And of course, uh, Teresa Randall, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what happened in her career, who derailed her or shut her off, but she should be a household name as far as I'm concerned between that and Sugar Hill, but, um, but Lee Daniels. Yeah. I reserve judgment. It was, it seemed to, uh, it certainly was a Lee Daniels directed, uh, project. You saw the trauma porn, you saw the emphasis on okay. black pain and death. You saw the spectacle. It's Lee okay. Daniels, right? <laughs> <laughs> I never know where you're going. And sometimes it goes left. And I was like, how do we get, well, out well, I mean, and, but, 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 but in all fairness and defense of Lee Daniels, it is a, it is a, a, a white facing, commercial media production and like Barry Gordy said to uh, uh, at least according to the scholars who have done the scholarship on this and for those who want to kind of check say what's real what's not real there are a number of, start with this Billy Holiday herself with William Duffy her co-writer Lady Sings the Blues and there are some you know obviously some things like she wasn't born in Baltimore her mama wasn't you know, 13. Uh, mom was 19, actually older than her father. She was born in Philly. Then they moved to Baltimore. But then there's a recent book, and there are a number of good books on Billie Holiday. There are over 40 books that have been written about Billie Holiday. Uh, my very good friend, Fair Griffin, up at Columbia, did a great one called If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery. I mean, and there's a number of books. Uh, uh, um, the great Robert O'Mealy, another good brother out of Columbia, they have a jazz kind of formation workshop study group they do. He did a book on Lady Day, The Many Faces of Lady Day. But one of the more recent books is this one, uh, John Sved, who's also up there. In fact, John Sved is an interesting, uh, he is the actually director for the Center of Jazz Study at Columbia when this came out in 2015. It's called Billy Holiday, The Musician and the Myth. If you want to get one single volume on that, do that because you'll find out that, um, that well, as let me finish the, the point I was going to make about Barry Gordy. And then we'll we, we'll keep talking about this for a little while. Uh, as Barry Gordy told Diana Ross, who was concerned that, you know, I don't you know, this is a lot of fiction in this thing. You're doing this Lady Sings the Blues movie that you made because Barry Gordy wanted to go into Hollywood. 
And he said, you know, she said, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about this. And his thing was white people get to make up stuff in biopics. It's all imaginary. Why should black people be any different? And I think uh, this particular, this current movie followed that same tack. Uh, it, as, as my old uh, teacher, my old Jegna, uh, Theophilo Benga would say, they mixed many things. They mix many things, and 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 it's interesting. I, I read something that Susan Lloyd Parks said in an interview, in fact, and they asked her about what she thought about it. I wish I had written it down somewhere, but she she was talking about the idea. Oh yeah, yeah. She says, huh, "I could see this love affair that she has with Jimmy Fletcher, which she, you know, apparently they did have a kind of romance. They had a, but he wasn't in the room when she." passed away or just, I mean, no, nah, none of that's real. Um, but Susan Lloyd Park says, I could see this love affair that she has with Jimmy Fletcher because it tells the story of the love affair that black Americans have with America. It's about a black American woman living in America who's been in love with her country her whole life. Black Americans love this country, often at our peril. And at that moment, I realized that uh, the same schizophrenia that gripped the producers and and of uh, amend gripped the creators of United States versus Billy Holiday. In fact, let me just qualify that by going right to Billy Holiday's autobiography. In fact, she has a chapter on what happened to her, and uh, she was not uh, uh, she did not have a lawyer when she was uh arraigned in 1947, I guess that was. She, uh, the deal that was made was worked out right there in front of her by the judge and the feds. Um, she was sent to West Virginia to prison for that year, as we know. But as she says in chapter 17, don't know if I'm coming or going. She said it was called the United States of America versus Billie Holiday. And that's just the way it felt. Sister Susan Lloyd Parks, brilliant playwright as you are, you certainly don't speak for me. And I don't know that you speak. In fact, I suspect you don't speak for Billy Holiday when you say, I looked at this and I saw this love affair because I knew it was a love affair with America. Yeah, the American Negro has fallen into an abusive relationship with this country, it seems to me. It's a codependent relationship, actually. It's very interesting. When you read, when you look at the documentary of men, for example, you know, black folks dress up, plead, demand, ask nicely, do everything to get the attention of this country to get the attention of those founding fathers, to get the attention of, you know, and every time, but see what's happening, every time the Negro threatens to leave, to do something for themselves or to move out of, well, the, you know, America sings the sweet song, I'll be better, I'll be better. And it's interesting listening to Larry Wilmore because remember there's six, there's six uh, episodes of this documentary. It opens with Will Smith, kind of closed with Will Smith. And in between, you see the actors, the interlocutors. You got Citizen, you got Resistance. So, so you're talking about a men we're going into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, 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 I'm going to go back to Billy Holiday. I just want to make no, this. Because I, I love the tie-in because I was, you know, I wanted to, you know, highlight a few things. I only watched the first episode, but go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, well, now, very quickly, Citizenship, Citizen's the first one, right? That tells you right there where it's going. American exceptionalism. And I had this debate actually with one of the people who was actually in the documentary when we were uh, at the Museum of African American History and Culture talking about the 1619 Project. They did this big day long thing about it. And I remember uh, Professor Foner, uh, Eric Foner, I'm like, you know, man, why is citizenship the gold standard of humanity? And the pursuit of citizenship ties us to this American mythology that is utterly indefensible. Utterly indefensible. And so uh, we'll, we can talk, talk some more about that in a minute, but then resistance, weight, control. And in the control uh, 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 piece, which is the third, I guess the third, no, fourth, the fourth episode in Citizen, um, we hear somebody say, you know, there is, uh, there is this commitment to America that we have to have, that we, we have, we love this country. I'm thinking, what are you talking about? There's no culture called American. There's no comprehensive culture called American. And then love is the fifth uh, session and then promise. And at the very end of the last episode, Larry Wilmore comes, who's one of the interlocutors, and he says, by God, I'm an American. Look at our history. The point of America, because then, because, I, I, you know, I'm sure they're anticipating people looking at this and well, not white people to my black people looking at this like. Here we go again. So trying to get ahead of that, Larry Wilmore's like, well, you know, the point of America, we know all this stuff happened, but the point is the promise. The point is the promise. 
And he says, words have power. And I'm thinking, duh, the point is the promise. Dude, this sounds like a straight abusive relationship. More abusive, perhaps, than even Billie Holiday's with her three husbands and all the brothers who played like they was going to be her husbands. More abusive, perhaps, even than the relationship she had with uh, the brother who was the fed, was the was the sellout, who to the end of his life said, I regret what they made me do with, uh, to Billie Holiday. I'm saying they made you do something. Bruh, you was in there. You did. You did the damn thing yourself. You jammed her up. The thing happened in Philly. Then she drove back to New York. And then that's when they capped her and then brought her back to Philadelphia. So, I mean, it's whole the whole thing, like it says, in Lady Sings the Blues. And then, uh, by the way, she didn't want to title this Lady Sings the Blues because she said, I'm not a blues singer. In fact, Billie Holiday very, did very few pure blues in her career. Uh, one of them was on the B-side, actually, of, the Stra of Strange Fruit, which uh, I think was Columbia let her release, said, hey, we ain't gonna record this, but we'll let you record it with another label. And she goes and recruits, uh, uh, records Strange Fruit, which she was introduced to in 1939 by a dude named Meyer, uh, uh, Mer uh, Mayor Marinpool. Marinpool was his name, the author. He was a New York City teacher. He's a poet. Uh, he's, he's credited not only with the lyrics for Strange Fruit, but he's also credited with helping out with another song called The House I Live In, the one that Paul Robeson and Frank Sinatra recorded. But at any rate, the B-side of that recording uh, was a song called Fine and Mellow. It's one of the few blues that she did in terms of pure blues. And it, it linked her. And again, the cast, the ensemble cast was really something. I mean, Tyler James Williams come a long way from since everybody loves Chris. Right. He he played a pivotal figure in in in, in Billy Holiday's life. The great Lester Young, the man who gave her the nickname Lady Day. In fact, Prez uh, is the name that she gave to him. And they, and, uh, they had had an on-again, off-again relationship in the 50s. Uh, they didn't speak for a, a few years, and then they then they, then they they hooked up again, and they kind of back and forth. And there's a very famous recording, one of her few television broadcast recordings. Um, Nate, Nat Henhoff and some others put together this thing uh, on jazz, a live broadcast for CBS, I guess it was. And um, you see... Uh, they got Bay Count Basie. Um, you see Jerry Mulligan. You see um, Coleman Hawkins, and she does Fine and Mellow, which is on the other side of the um, other side of the uh, Strange Fruit recording. And so you see Lester Young, and they they had this thing, and it's really amazing. Y'all can go on YouTube and watch it if you want. You you hear them playing. Then Jerry Mulligan takes his solo, and then. I'm sorry, uh, Coleman Hawkins takes his solo, and then here comes Lester Young, the pure blues man. And you and you see her just look, she starts, she just looks at him, and they vibing back and forth, and then he goes through his little solo, and she's just like, and she looks at him and says, and when he finishes, she comes in smooth. He wears hydrate pants, stripes are really yellow. He wears hydra pants, stripes are really yellow. But when he starts in to love me, he is so fine and mellow. And then you just like them two right there. Now in the movie, you don't you don't get that. Why? Because this vehicle, in some ways, is almost overpowered by the sister playing Billy Holiday, and the narrative is. It recedes into the background and, and, and the truth is so much more fascinating than what was portrayed. And if you watch it, I think there's almost an overburdening of this trope of Billy Holiday as a tragic figure. In fact, I'll say one more thing and then let's keep talking about this. We'll go back and forth. I thought I pulled another book that I think is very important. If you want to. And there's a lot of stuff been written on jazz. This is a very good book by Gerald Horn. It's called Jazz and Justice. Came out a couple of years ago. Racism and the Political Economy of the Music. You can't understand. In fact, not even a couple of years ago. It's 2019. I guess it is a couple of years ago now. You can't understand the United States versus Billie Holiday in any way without understanding the context of the war on black people that really kind of, again, reinforces the idea that this hostage situation, this, this abusive relationship, this codependent narrative 
that keeps popping up in these uh, documentaries, all of which get many of which get dropped in Black History Month. Again, going exactly against what Carl G. Woodson was talking about. In fact, Woodson said that he said about the only thing these mischievous orators have to talk about is the race problem and how it can be solved. That is not Black History Month. But at any rate, you know, when you read Horn's book and you look at stuff related to that, what you see is that there was a war, the war against black life, which began as soon as we got snatched into this criminal enterprise, found its way into a cultural war as well. That Harry uh, Anslinger character, mm -hmm. that's the guy who set up, who set up that unit, that anti-narcotic unit, that's extension of the federal government's war on black people because he remember now this is the same guy anslinger because you don't really get too much of this if you're listening and you can you kind of know the backstories you can hear some of the gestures toward it it's like any other thing i'm sure they tried to cram everything in aslinger was one of the uh feds who was coming out of the department of treasury during prohibition they were fighting prohibition remember prohibition is like from 1920 to like 1933 and they failed because alcohol, legal. Now, Billie Holiday was born in 1915. Just before she was born, 1914, a law was passed that uh, made opiates illegal. Because before that, like the same plant that they would get cocaine from was what they used to make Coca-Cola. We know that. All the people know that. But what, there was no federal drug policy. Marijuana wasn't illegal. This kind of thing. You know, so they started criminalizing drugs after that. And, you know, it's interesting. I was going back through the New York Times. I was reading some other stuff and I went back through New York Times. There's an article in the New York Times from February 8th, 1914. Here's the headline. Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace. Murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey by prohibition. What the hell does that even mean? In this long article, which takes up a whole page, you know how the Times will do those whole page exposés, they talking about super Negroes in the South. They say, this is not like morphine, which is, you know, people can take, but it can help aid in digestion. It's a different way to be consumed. No, cocaine, you sniff it. And if you sniff it, it just automatically surges. It sends you into this surge. And they start talking about these super Negroes who feel like they are impervious to bullets. Then they start talking about how this one cat uh, the police came in and shot him. In fact, let me see. Can I read it? Because I pulled up the article. The thing will make you. Oh, my God. Let me see if I can find it right quick. If I can't, I'll just have to. Uh, yeah. No, I'm not going to be able to find it because the thing the thing is. Uh, oh, wait. Proof against bullets. But the drug produces several other conditions that make the fiend a particularly dangerous criminal. This is New York Times. One of these conditions is a temporary immunity to shock or resistance to the knockdown effect of fatal wounds. Then he talks about this guy in, in Asheville, North Carolina, the chief of police who goes to arrest this black man who they accused of assaulting people. And he says, when the unsuspecting Negro reached the middle of the room, the officer closed the door to prevent the escape. The guy, he said, pulled the knife. Sound familiar. Uh, knowing that he must kill the man or be killed himself. I feared for my life. OK, George Zimmerman, yesterday, anniversary of Trayvon Martin. Uh, the chief drew his revolver, placed the muzzle over the Negro's heart and fired, intending to, quote, kill him right quick. But the shot did not even, let me go up to the top, did not even stagger the man. Oh, come on. He said delayed death. Now, I'm, I'm pausing here and then let's pause here. We let's, let's have some conversation about the context in this in which this is happening, because I'm thinking about I didn't watch Bill Maher. I can't watch Bill Maher. I have to watch Bill Maher for things that people are talking about Bill Maher watching because his soft, his, his, his white nationalism vacillates between soft white nationalism and hard white nationalism. He's a white nationalist and, and, and his nativism is barely concealed. You know, he, he's, he's a nativist. And I don't I don't, you know, begrudge him that I understand. You know, he's scared like the rest of a lot of white people scared, you know, not the people watching us because they choose humanity. Y'all choose humanity over this concept of whiteness, which has to go. But. You know, this idea that these Negroes are dangerous and they're dangerous from using drugs. The drugs, by the way, that everybody uses. Hell, if Bill Maher, every, every, out of every three jokes he tells, one of them is a drug joke about drug use. And so, but when it's black people, the feds came against them and realizing, and Gerald writes about this in Jazz and Justice. He says these black musicians in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s, many of them 
had ties to the black political radicals. Some of them played for the Garvey movement. Many of them played uh, for uh, the Communist Party at, at stuff and stuff they had. And remember, this Communist Party is doing a lot of interracial stuff. Billy Holiday gets caught up, not caught up. Billy Holiday gets pulled into that world. Billy Holiday politically, her politics very liberal in that sense, interracial, this kind of thing. And when the feds start going after these black musicians for abusing drugs, they start trying to break and, and you know break them. You start trying to get them to flip on each other. They won't do it. And very quickly, very quickly, um, this cat uh, Harry uh, Aslinger realizes. We can't get them to turn on each other. They tried to be anti-marijuana. They wouldn't do it. He hated jazz. He said, jazz sounds like it comes from the jungles in the dead of the night. This is the white boy. And you, you see some of that. But they tried to go out after him first on these marijuana laws they start passing. They we were all in solidarity. When they couldn't get to them, they decided to shrink their target to one person, Billie Holiday. They went after Billie Holiday. Because they figured they could take her down if they could if just harass her. And one of her godchildren said, based on notes that his mother had, who was Billy Holiday's friend, and, and again, he uh Sped writes about this. He says, you know, to the day she died, my mama died. She said it was the feds to kill Billy Holiday. They drove her to that. She kept trying to get clean, she tried, and she realized that I'm sick. In fact, she writes about that in her book. She says, Imagine if the government chased sick people with diabetes. Put a tax on insulin, this is Billy Holiday, mm. and drove it into the black market, told doctors they couldn't treat them. By the way, that is true. The scene where she's in the courtroom and she says, just send me the treatment. Now, what is not true is the judge gave her the year and a day and she looks back, starts cussing at the lawyer. I paid you all this money. She didn't have a lawyer. She did not. She was not represented. All right. Told doctors they couldn't treat them and then caught them, prosecuted them for not paying their taxes, and then sent them to jail. If we did that, everyone would know we were crazy. Yet we do practically the same thing every day in the week to sick people hooked on drugs. She said, to the, I was, I'm was, i sick. Help. The jails are full and the problem is getting worse every day. And that's, and that's, and that is disproportionately black and brown even during this period. So I, I'm saying all that as a backdrop to say that they went after Billy Holiday because they couldn't crack the black musicians, many of whom got caught up in Heron. Many of, and in fact, she talks about. In fact, let me just say a couple other things about that in terms of the the the, the, uh, the movie. First of all, never watch a movie, never watch a documentary as a substitute for study. That's simply not it. So when people say, you know, I got a good documentary, I'm gonna show my students. Okay, if that's all you're gonna do, it's better than nothing. But it should never be nothing. You got to surround it because even now people are thinking, oh, well, what else is not true about that documentary? It's, it's I mean, uh, that film, it's, it's a lot of stuff like that. But at any rate, when you see her, they give her, I think it's morphine they give her as a fix because she's sick as she's even uh, going to trial. Then they give her some when she's going to jail. In fact, she met Franklin Roosevelt. She got convinced by one of her friends, another one who was connected to the to the radical, so-called radical left, the Communist Party. She was in those circles as well. This is a sister, another Titan, Hazel Scott. Oh, yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hazel Scott convinced Billie Holiday, come to the White House with me. We, we, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, there, I'm supposed to perform at this thing. It's 1944. She said, I'm going, you know, Billie Holiday's like, man, I'm trying. And this is the, this is the class piece coming in. I ain't trying to be around them sadiddy Negroes. They they don't like me. They're going to be checking my arms to see if I got tracks. I mean, I, this class thing is real. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So Hazel Scott convinces her. And Billie Holiday admired Franklin Roosevelt. She said, well, I don't want to, I wouldn't mind meeting Franklin Roosevelt. So they do their, their sets. They perform. But Billie Holiday is like, I'm going to stick around until I meet Roosevelt. I got I, I to gotta see Roosevelt. She needs to go to the ladies' room. She is losing her mind. I, I, I don't want to leave. So eventually she can't take it no more. She goes to the elevator. She pressed the elevator. The door is open. Who's in the elevator in a wheelchair? But Franklin Roosevelt. She meets Franklin Roosevelt. She's talking to Franklin Roosevelt. But here's the thing that's mind blowing, Professor Hunter. She says, I'd never seen him in a wheelchair. You know, people didn't see Roosevelt in a wheelchair. That's right. You know. But, she, but he was he was at home. So, you know, he's, he's with his guards, whatever. But she said, I looked at him. I looked in the eye and immediately I said, this man is in pain. Y'all not treating him right. 
you got him on the wrong thing. I knew he was on morphine right then. I could oh. tell. This is a jump. Looking oh. at a jump. You know what I'm this is crazy. I'm saying, look, if y'all gonna make a movie, you get one shot. <laughs> Why y'all tell some of these stories that demystify America? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Y'all gonna make Billy Holiday into a tragic figure when the president of the United States was strung out on drugs? But let's just pause. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Ken. Common theme, a couple of things. You often call this, and I, I repeat it, a criminal enterprise, but watching the first episode of Amend is not a criminal enterprise. They use the law to make everything that they do that is horrific legal. That's right. Well, I mean morally. Morally. I mean legally. It's, the, it's the immoral, but criminal. it's legal. It's not criminal. Well, it's not it's not criminal legally. It's morally criminal. See, okay. that's the thing. All right. All right. Yeah. But what they do, what they do is they commingle the idea of the law with the idea of some cultural authority. See, that's the trick. So they don't just say this is the law. And since we made the law, if we're going through the law, we're doing it the way we want to do it. What they say is, you see, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary. They go to natural law. In other words, God told us to do this. <laughs> and so here's the trick. Once they get that, now you got a choice to make because you're not just buying into the Western legal system. You're buying into the Western cultural system. And at the center of the Western cultural system, as John Herbert Clark would say, is the image of God. So now America is ordained by God. If you break these laws, you're going against God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's, let's unpack that for a second, because I had an interesting conversation with Dr. Carl Hart this week on my radio show. I saw, I mean, I saw part of the clip on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It was a 40 minute interview. I put the clip up because I was struggling. And in the midst of the interview, I had to t I had a conversation with myself about why do I feel this way? Why am I having this visceral reaction? Well, because, you know, we've seen the destruction of drugs and we know the origin, which is why I can agree with him fundamentally about the criminalization. He even talked about the cocaine being in Coca-Cola. Only white people could get it at soda fountains in this country because black people couldn't go to those counters and drink Coca-Cola. But when right. Coke decided to bottle that Coca-Cola and black people can have that same happy, good feeling, yes. it was a problem. And then yes. that's why they had to then use the media yes. to demonize and to tell the same stories that Birth of a Nation told. That's and it's right. just been a constant drumbeat ever since we got here. That's right. The reason why we are enslaved is because we're inferior. No, we're the first people on this planet. Come on. How are we inferior? Oh, Come on. now we're out. Frederick Douglass in the first episode of Amen he gets free. He's happy. He runs into a person from a plantation in Virginia named Jake. Jake's like, that's not my name anymore. And don't trust anybody. Don't even trust me because right. they snatching up black people, snatching up black people, putting them back in bondage. That's real. But it it, it set the, the framework and what I walked away with, because I think, you know, again, if you do the study that you say, you can pull gems from even. Oh, no question. So I walked Everything. away. I was like the, the, Instead of running and hiding, Frederick Douglass did the exact opposite. Right. He went out and started speaking. He went out and started talking, wrote books, and it put America on its ass. So there, to me, there's the blueprint right there because the, it got so bad for white folk in the South that they denied that he was ever in bondage. They were like, he's lying. They brought him in from Europe. He can't be, you know, an enslaved per or slave, what they called him then, because there's no way that this Negro can be a slave. He's not a slave. This is a, a made up thing by the abolitionists. But it speaks to a couple of things. First of all, when we show up as our natural selves in full glory, not afraid, speaking the truth, they don't have a choice. And then he had a newspaper, so we got to have our media outlets and we have to tell our own narratives. This is the problem. In Hollywood, in this documentary space, people get to, you know, even black people, because we have been indoctrinated into the school system, educated ostensibly by the Nazis in our own country, right? right. Well, in this country. In this country, the, the, the representation of Nazis who took the Nuremberg laws from the Jim Crow laws, this there's a connection. Jews don't send their children to Nazi schools. Nope. And America don't give a damn. Remember, Werner von Braun was brought here to help launch the space program. So <laughs> let's be clear. Ain't no morals involved. <laughs> you understand? No, but but, but but a couple of points you write quick. You make. Um, and for those of you who want to really read about the background, some of this, there's a good book uh, over here, Johan Hari, H-A-R-I, called Chasing the Screen, the uh, Opposite of Addiction. And he talks about this first chapter, in fact, called The Black Hand, 
where he says, where does war on drugs start? Does it start with Reagan? It start with Nixon? No, it starts in the 1930s and before, as you say, Harry Aslinger, he traces Aslinger. Aslinger's papers are at Pennsylvania State University. Hari, H-A-R-I, he goes out there. He goes all over the world, really, tracing this stuff on opiates, how they criminalized and how they went forward. But the point you're raising, that first episode, switching back to a man, Fred Douglas, this is exactly right. This is why we have to have our own pl platforms. When you look at the uh, Peter Ripley, for example, University of North Carolina Press published, uh, edited rather, for publication, five volumes. There's a one volume edited volume representing the best, as well, his selection of the five. But I, I, I recommend, and look, we're not talking about going out and buying all these books. Go to your library and tell them, do you have the black abolitionist papers? And then when you see when you see the black abolitionist papers, you realize Fred Douglas is a towering figure who is not only not alone, many don't agree with him. You got Henry Howland Garnett. They mentioned Mariah Stewart, which I thought was interesting. But even how they bring people in, because they know they got to talk about some of these other black people, even how they bring them in, like they bring in Malcolm X for something that is so far uh, beyond his political. In fact, they bring him in on the idea that you must look at the status of women in a society to see. And then they transition into Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the fight for 14. And I'm saying that ain't even why are you bringing Malcolm? Because you got to show Malcolm's face again, because we don't own this platform. But when you talk about Douglas, you cannot talk about Frederick Douglas credibly without talking about how Douglas was debated and engaged on the question of America citizenship and the range of possibilities for black people. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no one person better equipped. You can talk about Mary Ann Shad Carey and others, but there's no one person better equipped to do that than his partner in the newspaper business for a time, the great Martin Robeson Delaney. Delaney was like, we can leave. We can go to we can go to Haiti. We can go. He went to, he went to Nigeria, what became Nigeria. And then he comes back and becomes the first commission major, along with uh, uh, Major Augusta, the surgeon. Martin Delaney becomes one of the first two black majors in the United States military. Lincoln gives him the commission because Delaney tells Lincoln, look, man, give us the guns. We'll handle this. And we need black officers because he's, you know, this glory model, you know, Shaw, nice guy, he died, gives his life, whatever. We need black officers. So Lincoln is like, I got you. Douglas never gets right with that. Robert Levine thinks he writes about this. He says, you know, Douglas was never quite good with the fact that Delaney got a commission when he really kind of wanted a commission too. And Lincoln didn't give it to him. Levine's argument, Le Levine speculates that the reason Lincoln gave it to Delaney is because he realized that uh, Martin Delaney would kill me to get free. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so in other words, if I want to win this war, you know what I'm saying? Put the flag aside. Lincoln's a pragmatist. You understand? But I'm saying I have to say this. None of that tension is in the first episode of Amend. The idea is somehow this whole project was about our aspiration to be included. That is so far from reality that it, it, it just reinforces this, this, this codependent relationship that they keep trying to push down our throats. That is not true. You got to go look at the debates. In fact, Fred, this is the last thing I'll say about it right quick. Frederick Douglass works overtime to stop one of the conventions. I forget it was, 19, it was 1842, 1843. I forget they were in Troy, New York. Henry Highland Garnett gives an address called Address to the Slaves. And they event, end up publishing it along, they put it together with David Walker's appeal from the 1820s. They put the two pieces together and they published them. Walker's appeal and Garnett's address. Henry Garnett. Henry Garnett is like, where is the blood of your fathers? Has it all run out of you? They call from the graves. We must now strike the blow. He wants these free blacks in, in New York state to adopt this. And Douglas is like, bruh, look now, <laughs> we got, Douglas is a genius. Douglas is an incredible orator, but Douglas is not alone. You got Garnett, you got Delaney, you got Mary Ann Shad, you got all these other people. Mary Ann Shad family, Abraham Shad, they leave, they go to Canada. In fact, Martin Delaney is so incensed at Douglas because uh, this white woman shows up, writes this novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, abolitionist, yes, for sure. Oh, slavery's bad. Okay. Delaney writes Douglas and says, hey, man, you know, your girl just ripped off Josiah Henson, right? You know, that's Josiah Henson's literal story. He's in Canada. And then and then Delaney tells Douglas in, print, in writing, he says, 
I hope some of them book sales she got, I hope some of that money she sent into Josiah Henson since he had to leave the country and couldn't come back. And then Delaney so and since finally, he starts his, he has his own newspaper, the Anglo-African, he's with these other cats. He publishes, as far as I'm concerned, one of the great books. In fact, don't read Douglas, don't read no slave narratives before you get this. Blake or the Huts of America. Martin Delaney says, cabins? The hell you talk? You know what? I got this. He writes a novel where the, the hero of this novel, Henry Blockers, this guy escapes esca from slavery, goes back, gets his wife, uh, gets his parents, gets them out, goes back. He's looking for his wife because they done sold her away at the beginning of the novel, and he's incensed. Everywhere he goes, he's meeting with black people. He meets with the Native Americans in the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia. He gets on a ship in some kind of way, works his way back to Africa in reverse fashion to plot with them. And as the novel reaches its apex, he sails to the Caribbean. You know what he's doing? He's planning an international slave rebellion. That's very different than the first chapter of Amend. Martin Delaney, I mentioned, because you talk about him, it blows your game. Let me ask you, because uh, I thought that Harriet Jacobs, who I read, Harriet yes. Jacobs, who they talked about, yes. Harriet Jacobs, I thought, because she was friends with Harriet Beecher Stowe. Yes. Talk, I thought that she stole it from Harriet Jacobs. Now, well, she, she, did, she, she drew from a number of sources, and she had her own creative intelligence. Again, this ain't really an attack on... Harriet Beecher Stowe as much as it is reinforcing the point you're making, which everybody, please listen. Without our own platforms, you don't get the complexity of what we're talking about right now. And so if you turn your children over to a Netflix documentary and Netflix has an agenda, Netflix made, I mean, I was looking at it, it made like $25 billion last year and they're going to give a hundred million dollars. They say, we're going to create black content. No, no, no. That's not an act of charity. You're investing. Because, see, the world is looking more and more like us. If you want to be in this world, you're going to have to do it. But you're not just going to be in this world on our terms. You're going to keep telling the story to keep you in power as long as you can. And so the whole discussion of Stowe, what we know, if we know anything, is Harry Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, if you're going to start talking about uh, what happened with um, Harriet Jacobs, if you're going to talk about Martin Delaney, oh, wait, is that? Yeah, we're going to have to do the platform for that. Because our children mess around and think it was about this other thing, and it wasn't at all. But, but those books are classic. I remember reading Uncle Tom's Cabin and was, you know, as a child. Oh, me too. Find in school. Yeah. And that was the only entry point. And I assumed the writer was black, found out she was white. And then as I, in my adult years that I realized, because I had to, you know, I read Harriet Jacobs. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. Right. He told this story to her. Of course, Harry Beecher Stowe could write better because Harriet Jacobs was in bondage and yep. needed a formal training. But, you know, that narrative, she didn't give her credit. And, no. and, nope. and, you know, as we move forward, and again, this platform is important. Doing this Africana studies is important. But again, our ch people are being indoctrinated into a system that is teaching them things. And we don't have the other sources. There were no footnotes in my classroom to tell no. me to read Harriet Jacobs as a companion or to talk. I never heard of Martin Delaney until you brought him up. A couple Martin of years Delaney, I'm and, and not only that, Stowe was so pressed on this. She, she publishes another book called The Keys to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Because she got now she got to show her work. But it still doesn't displace the fact that Josiah Henson whose narrative is out there for people to read. Y'all read the narrative of Josiah Henson and be like, what the hell? If you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, why why should she have to, uh, she ain't got to do, she, rip, she rips it off because she can. And I ain't mad at Harriet Beecher Stowe. I'm mad at us. We got to do this. In fact, let me just mention this other thing. We can read Lady Sings the Blues. They make a movie, Motown and them, fiction, Lady Sings the Blues. Now they remake United States versus Billie Holiday. You know what Billie Holiday wanted to name this? She wanted to name her autobiography bitter crop mm. bitter crop was the name she wanted the publisher they said this you know let's do lady sings the blues because we could you know and, and plus drug you know the drug addiction that kind of sells so we did and she's like yeah but i don't really sing blues no but but the blues you know the blues and the drugs and you know bitter crop that's what she wanted to name it <laughs> but you know nah nah can you blame us when Everybody has gone through the same school system. How can we be blamed for not knowing something when we didn't? We don't know what we don't know. When yes. the threats, how do how do we? I don't blame. I don't blame. I don't blame. Uh, yeah, that's good. Thank you. I don't blame by blame. I should take maybe blame is too harsh a word. Thank you. I I'm looking for the source of how how we did this. 
as Carter G. Woodson writes in the Miseducation of the Negro, he's got a whole chapter, How We Missed the Mark. This is 1933. After he's been publishing this stuff, uh, some of it he published in the Negro World, some of this, he, uh, Marcus Garvey and Amy Jakes Garvey's paper, some of the things he published in other places, he pulls them out together in 1933. And then he's got a chapter, How We Missed the Mark. This is 33. I understand. This is just as, in fact, uh, she was born in 15. Yeah, in fact, that's the same year that Billie Holiday makes her first recording. And shortly thereafter, she's going to be hanging with Count Basie and them, Benny Goodman. That's when Lester Young, who's in the Basie band, also Fletcher Henderson and them, comes to New York. But Lester Young stays with her and her mother in New York, this kind of thing. He named Nick gives her the nickname Lady Day. Woodson is saying, even then, we missed the mark. What happened? Now, Woodson is talking to the black schools. He's talking to the country, but he's really talking to black people, and the black people are in the segregated schools. This is very important to understand. Even in the Amend documentary, when they get to the 1950s and Brown, you see them pushing that Kenneth Clark line again. Here we go with them damn dolls. M confusing black people as if somehow black self-hatred can be remedied with proximity to white people. Wouldn't that reinforce the pathology? But if there is a pathology to begin with, because if you look at the at the, the, the test that Kenneth and Mamie Clark gave, and I think about my, my friends Wade Boykin, um, Jules Harrell, um, the black psychologists who talk about this, they say, you know, when you start asking these black children more questions, it gets to be a more complicated uh, 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 palette. For example, you ask a child, okay, who's the pretty doll? They push the white doll because that's what they see on movies and all this kind of thing. Then you say, which one of these dolls you trust? They push the black doll. <laughs> in other words, see, but 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 in a man, you're just gonna cut it. Oh yeah, see, this is the pathology. And then, no, bro, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And so, who my, the point I'm trying to make in terms of you know who we could blame or this system? And oh yeah, that's what it was. Even in that section, in that segment, I forget which episode it was. I have to remember now. But a point was made that said, you know, black people. You know, people. Some people say that black people, if they could have just gotten equal resources, it would have been okay. That separate would have been okay if it were equal. And no, that's not the case. And it's come down hard on that. And I'm thinking to myself, that is a severe editing of the debate that was going on. Zora Neale Hurston, for example, was excoriated for saying, "Look, this integration thing. Look, we got to have equality under the law. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you give up control of your schools," We in trouble. Du Bois, one of the last talks he gave before he and Shirley Graham, the boys left for Africa, whither now and why, 1960, Johnson C. Smith University. He's given a talk to Black, uh, the, the Association of Black Social Science, well, Association of Social Science, uh, which is the Black teachers. He says, the laws are going to change. And when the laws change, we're going to have a real issue of race and culture because we're going to disappear if we're not careful. And they're going to you're going to have black children drop out of school. They're not going to teach any black curriculum. He said, this is why we have to right now decide which direction we're going in. So what has happened is we are now in a society where people say we and we are taught that we means everybody in the country and we ain't never met everybody in the country. So the things we feel, I'm talking about black people, the things we know to be true from experience, somehow we bring them before the, the tribunal of justice or we bring them before and they get rejected with, look, we're going to do the best we can. But as Larry Wilmore said, the real key to America is the future. Look, I'm in the present. <laughs> OK, look, you keep talking about this future and then you mess around and back mouth. And make Dawi Diggs and all these talented art, uh, uh, artists, you know, uh, uh, what's my man, Lin Manuel Miranda, and all them. You can then, then go back and make George Washington black. What the hell just happened? Look, we're not just satisfied with you fixing, getting, try to get you fixated on the future. We're gonna rewrite the past, so you will hum and sing and dance and make George Washington your daddy. And as these kids saying to me, "You're not my dad," and I don't feel that you are either. So who do we blame? You've got to always remember individuals don't beat institutions, meaning that the institutions that we have, the educational system that we never had full control of. And I, I should mention this, by the way, because somebody brought up lynching. I think they want to talk about lynching and the context was strange fruit. There were two pieces of federal legislation that are very important. And in fact, there's another book I encourage people to kind of check out. People know the name Harold Cruz. They know him mostly for his 1967 book, uh, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. But I like this book. 
I mean, I read this book my first year of law school, and I never forget. That's my first semester, first year of law school. I came home to Nashville. I'm in the public library. I'm studying, and I said, you know what? I want to read something to cleanse my palate, and then I keep going because you know I came out of HBCU. We was already fighting. That's why I went to law school. We're going to change these damn laws. Title VI, Civil Rights Act 64. Y'all not going to just destroy black colleges. So I said, let me just look around in here. I'm Nashville. So I pulled this book off the shelf, Plural But Equal by Harold Cruz. Man, it blew my mind because Harold Cruz said, we talk about the NAACP. He said, no, before the NAACP, there was the National Afro-American Council. And you highlighted Timothy Thomas Fortune last week. Very important. He said, black people were pushing in the 19th century, he said, during this period, right after Reconstruction, when this betrayal, this remix starts going, you see, and by the way, in Lady Sings the Blues, Billie Holiday starts in the first couple of chapters, by in first chapter, really, talking about her mother's grandmother who came out of enslavement in Virginia, who Billie Holiday knew, who Billie Holiday helped feed and bathe, who they always told her as a child, don't let her lay down. So she slept in a chair because if she lay down, she gonna die. And Billie Holiday tells the tragic story of how her grandmother begged her one day, just let me lay down, just let me lay down. She said, no, grandma, they told me, uh, great, great, great grandma, you told me, no, 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 they told me, they, she let her lay down. And then they went to sleep and Billy Holiday writes in here. She said, when I woke up, her arm was around me and I couldn't get her arm. Or they had to break her arm to get me out from under her because she had died. In her sleep. And then they beat me because I was the one they told me. But she, I loved her and she used to tell her stories about slavery. I'm saying I have to say that she, Billy Holiday's great grandmother lived during the period Harold Cruz is talking about. And Harold Cruz talks about how the piece of legislation they were trying to get passed was this Blair education bill. He said the Blair education bill, had it passed the Senate, the other piece of legislation I'm thinking about is the anti-lynching legislation that Roosevelt did not support, did not push. And that was the legislation introduced in the 1920s, in 1921. That was the Dyer Anti-Lynching Act. It was a congressman, Congressman Dyer, who introduced it. It never passed. Uh, now you see uh, then Senator Kamala Harris, Cory Booker with a lot of signatories. They've got an anti-lynching piece that they introduced in 2019. They'll introduce it again. It hasn't passed yet. But the point is that um, the first big federal legislation that they wanted pushed in the wake of those Civil War amendments and the laws that came, Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act, which was the Third Reconstruction Act of 1871. That's the one, by the way, that Benny Thompson, uh, Congressman Thompson, has gone and filed a, a lawsuit in the United States District Court here in D.C., Thompson versus Trump, because Section 1 of the Ku Klux Klan Act, so-called Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, says that you can't interfere, you can't mount an insurrection to interfere with the government doing its business. Now, they'll probably throw that out because they got the court stack. But at any rate, what uh, Cruz is talking about is as they're pushing this, 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 this education bill, they, uh, the government now, they're saying we should be able to send all this money to the South. Because if you don't send money to the South for education, it's going to just, it's going to drag the country down because they are being locked into illiteracy. And so what about black people? Cruz says black people were the number one advocates of the, uh, of the Blair bill because the money was coming even during Jim Crow segregation, the money would be distributed to black schools equitably. And so what Cruz, the, the, the basis of his, of his book, that's where he starts here is, look, the laws should be equal, but when you lose institutional control, that's a problem. And what we haven't talked about finally is the things that happen in the wake of legal desegregation that resegregated us. The schools are more segregated now than they were even during that period Cruz is writing about. Except now, where the black principals? Where the black school teachers? Where's the black curriculum and the black narratives? No, they moving in the other direction. Take this out. Move that. We don't want to talk about this. Can we, can we have, we don't want no black history month. What the hell happened? The laws changed, but the society didn't change. And I don't care how many documentaries you make. You can't keep papering over this fundamental contradiction. And so who do I blame? I blame the structures. I blame the structures. Yeah, the structures create the people we have. And we got it. And, and individuals don't beat institutions, which is why, Professor Hunter, we have to have our own platforms and own institutions, don't we? Well, funny you should mention that. <laughs> I mean, it'd be a good thing to, to do, right? <laughs> funny you should say that, Dr. Carr. You know, ever since that uh, day, uh, 
during the beginning of the pandemic when you and I were having a weekend conversation and I asked you if I could hit record because we were recording then. Yeah. I knew that uh, this was the thing I didn't know I needed that was going to free me. Me too. In my life. So I just want to, first of all, thank you for the the spirit and the ancestors that live in you, thank uh, you. that you run with uh, and those that live with me that I run with because- yes. You know, both of us teach. We've been teaching. I've been teaching a better part of 20 years. NYU, Hunter College before that, high school kids in Harlem. You've been teaching uh, law and Africana Studies, head of the Africana Studies Department at Howard University. And there's always been this knowing, this knowing that this is inadequate. Yes. I can't tell you how many people have spent 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars. They're in debt. I know people that are 200, 300 thousand dollars in debt going to. No question going to higher education uh, p- places and still aren't free because that nope. dirty glass of water. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. So sitting here, I'm like, we do these classes. We started doing them live, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, mm-hmm. every Saturday. And it has turned into a thing where on any given uh, Saturday, by the end of the week, we'll have, you know, 40, 50,000 people having mm-hmm. come through a two, two and a half hour discussion. That's right. It's really a lesson. So it's it's I, re- I remember one of the classes we gave where you talked about the African way of knowing where folks would sit. Uh, the the jegna, is that what you call it? The teacher, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. the teacher would sit and the students would be in a c- circle around a tree. Yep. And they weren't separated by age. They weren't separated by, you know, ability to learn. They weren't put in these, you know, these designations. There was just lessons being taught and kids absorbed and they had conversations. And I think about Socrates, that question asking that he got from Africa. No in so um, I want to thank you because today we're launching narrative. Somebody asked in the in the chat, what is narrative? Well, the K is silent, like knowledge. <laughs> We're going to know some stuff, right? <laughs> like our moon. The Egyptians say it is our moon, although hidden who is the source of all life, power, and health. So the K is silent, not to mean it ain't there. <laughs> it's the thing that animates everything. You ain't got to say it. <laughs> so um, what I'm asking is because as you're talking and as we, you know, and I never know where you're going to go when we start these conversations. There'll be no. an entry point. But, you know, there's so many documentaries and there's so many movies and television shows. You know, we talked about Bridgerton and all, you know, that have a historic rooting that's not rooted in truth. Nope. So, so we 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 will believe because very few people read the text that we are talking about, all of the texts, all of the books. But I'm so proud of so many people got their libraries. Oh, they try, like, they try to stack their books up. I'm like, you better go ahead. It's amazing. Going on. But I want to, and I want to make sure that um, this is a, the collective. You know, we're not launching something that um, that is not uh, participatory. Everybody who is watching this. No question. I'm calling on you to participate, not just sign up for narrative. You can go to www.knarritiv.com <laughs> and sign up, but get five more people to sign up because what you're going to find mm. is you kick the tires and we want you to kick the tires and see what's missing. But the vision for this and, you know, it started this started as a book. It was going to be a book club. And I was talking with Kareem one one Sunday about doing a book club. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, because I want to get back into publishing and then I could publish books and it'll be a place. Ooh. That was the original. This was, you know, then I was like, this class. OK. Yeah. Then I was I was in a, um, a publishing giant publishing meetup and I popped in the guy that was running it. I was like, I was at a Comic Con one year with him. The only Comic-Con I've ever been to, shout out to Michael Davis. He invited me to his black panel. And the first and only time I've ever been to Comic-Con, I'm going to go when these things open back up again. But I'm sitting on the panel and this guy, because Michael was late, took, you know, took the MC and started, you know, introducing people. And I met him. His name's Carl Renato. And I, he was managing this thing. And I was like, what? This it was a huge undertaking. It was like a hundred plus publishers and writers and people. And he was bringing people into different rooms. If I, and I was like, I know him. Yes, I reached yes. out to him and I said, look, what are you doing? And at the time it was just like, can you manage my healthy, wealthy wise online, whatever, because I was going to do this virtual, um, you know, our virtual conference. And then we started talking 
and he's a filmmaker. He's into gaming. And he was like, let me bring in my man, Uraeus, who's in the comic book world. And we talk about comic books. And they're like the, the brothers of thunder in, in this space. And yes, yes. And then we started imagining because they're both educators too. So, you know, you teach, I teach, they teach, they're all teachers. And then they brought in their teachers. You brought in, you sent the list of teachers. And I was like, oh, why yeah. do I have a space yeah. where both teachers can be free? We've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for this. So uh, we're in beta. Everybody's just for us. Don't, you know, it's just for us. And, you know, tell your, tell five people. Tell five. You want to build this into the thing so that we can do the next documentary that is, that Carr is going to vet to make sure it is historically accurate and the team of historians that you have in your not, own. Not name. by myself. And we got people. Can I don't want you to stop. I just want to mention this one thing very quickly. We, we're college professors and we love our students. And we do everything. We sacrifice. We, we do everything for them. We really do. Let's be very clear, everybody listening. That we're not going to get free through education in college. It's an important tool. I'm not saying it's not. But what you just heard Professor Hunter say, the debt we all go into. And understand that what we're doing right now, like you said, like you said, Prof, looking at the books people are reading, the books people are talking about, I have no doubt in my mind, for example, because sometimes, you know, I, I mean, I'll scan, you know, we scan everything. Right. So I'm looking, I say, oh, New York Times best. And I'm looking at some of the books that are being featured. And I realize this is being driven by these Saturdays because this is not a book that was there. And now look at this. Number 13. What the hell? And I'm saying it to say this finally. And I want you please keep going because we, we, we listen, get by people. Everybody come because this is not about where you went to undergraduate. In fact, it's the anti where you went to undergraduate. This isn't about, oh, I studied this. No, no, it's the anti that. You know what you need for this right now? A brain and the will. And that's the way education is supposed to be. Du Bois said that in the education of black people. When he gives a talk, he's at Fisk and he says, I once saw the perfect system of education it was under a tree in Africa. They were sitting in the circle. This is what this is. So come on, yeah. Everybody been talking about waiting for it, ain't Professor Hunter? So she, she done built it now. If they build it, we will come, right? That's what they. That's what I, I read that somewhere. And I want to add one more caveat to the brain uh, and the will, love. Because oh, no question. This, this, this right here um, is born out of a love for knowledge and truth, but love of the people, man. Oh, this, we don't this, get this, here. We don't do this every. You don't give up your whole entire Saturday because mm -hmm. after that, after we get off, we both drain. Most of them run into another thing, though. I should say this right quick. James Baldwin has a quote that I mean, ba this is James Baldwin said, "Love is what helps you recognize what you don't remember." Mm. I say, you know what? So people say, "I didn't know that." Yeah, but you got the love. In fact, that's what. Look, in addition to the fact that Billy Holiday was born in Philly but raised in Baltimore, that's why I had to rock cop and state right here. Coppin is one of those HBCUs in Baltimore named for a black woman, Fanny Jackson Coppin, the master. She, look, love. Love is what helps you recognize what you don't remember. You got the love. Come on in. We'll get our memory back, but it helps you recognize it. That's what people do in every state. I didn't mean to interrupt, but when you said love, you're absolutely right. That's got to be the, the greatest no, of these. There's no interrupting one another because we are dancing. Uh, this is a spiritual dance that we do every Saturday. Um, and we are remembering. We are re membering so we have to bring and gather and bring more people in and as you're talking you know i i often you know i, I dub myself the architect because you know no you, have question. See, you have to see what the thing is going to look like but then you have to go all the way back to see how do you build it and mm. so what we're demonstrating here a narrative is how you build a thing from the ground up a thing that's going to be here long after everyone who's watching this is gone for thousands of years we're building the alexandria library we're building the pyramid at giza this is the genesis of that and everybody who is watching this is going to be responsible for adding another brick to that's this right thing as we start to continue my vision my vision is I want to see comic books and cartoons and graphic novels. I want to see novels and, and nonfiction biographies of people. I want to make sure that they're, you know, when we do black history and we go around the room, you know, in classrooms, they have all of them, Phyllis Wheatley and Frederick Douglass and all. I want all of the black people that we don't talk about. You talked about Hazel Scott, somebody, oh. a pianist. No, she wasn't just oh. a pianist. She wasn't just uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr.'s wife. Nope. 
That woman was amazing. Why don't hey, we know more about her? Well, we're going to talk about her narrative and Anna Hegeman and and yeah. oh, Paul Robeson's <laughs> wife. Oh, Essie Robeson. We wait, Essie, and there are books written about them. And like you said, Karen, equally if not more important. See, we're going to go into the archives. That's not everybody's job. Some of us have given our lives to that and give our lives to that. So come on over here. And what you've done, Karen, I mean, when you first started floating this and you started talking to me about it, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I went and got the A-team crew that I've been rolling with for decades now. What we said is finally. So guess what? Come with us. And like Saturdays, this is great. We have our conversations. We keep things current. In this other space, see, any class I'm doing, that's where you get the systematic now we're going to go through the method out. Now you got the books. Now you got the thing. Everybody's trying to scribble and write down. No, no, no. Come on over. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because what I'm doing now, I'm already outlining. I got probably about a dozen different outlines of. So if you think Saturday is what we count. No, 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 no. Now we're going to make the donuts. See, we eat the donuts on Saturday. But we're going to make everybody going to learn how to make the donuts. You got a 12 year old. Let's get her involved because she got to make the real documentary. And she, which means she got to go look at the ones that we've made that nobody ever mentions. We got filmmakers. We got, oh, yeah. In fact, Ta-Nehisi uh, Coates, I saw they said oh, that he yeah. may be doing the new uh, Superman. Yeah, and, I thought, and I thought to myself, did you see the uh, 70s uh, movie Black Superman? I know you did, because this won't be the first Black Superman if you make the Black Superman. In other words, it, it's a flawed movie, obviously. That, but this ain't the first time a Black person was doing Superman and of course, in the comments they got, but guess what? Come on the other side so that when this movie comes out, you can sit and say, okay, that was cool. Now, we're about to make something else. Why? Because we, we done learned about brother man, dictator of discipline. We done gone through static shock. We didn't know, we know all the history. Come, and now we're at, Marvel is doing some incredible things with non-white uh, artists, writers. I mean, this whole Marvel Futures thing they're doing is brilliant. The young sister who's managing that unit for Marvel is great. But guess what? All that money going to Marvel. So let's be clear. If you're going to have an institution, then you got to control and own the institution. And what the architect is building, what Professor Hunter is building, that's FUBU. For some of y'all old enough to remember that. For us, by us. That don't mean you got to be black to join. In fact, we want everybody to join. And, and finally, I'll say this. This is what's going to happen. Because we see it happen. This is how it works. Once you have the space and you're standing in your truth and having debate and dialogue and building and creating, Guess what shifts? The whole damn world. The whole damn world. Because when they had, and Gerald writes about this with the jazz uh, artists and jazz and justice. He says, those laws that they had that wouldn't let black and white performers perform together, those laws that they tried to go into cabarets and they they they, they busted in one in Philly, beat up uh, Bud Powell, the pianist, uh, took Theon Thelonious Monk's cabaret card, trying to get them jammed up on some old BS drug charge. Half these cats strung out on heroin while the white boys are strung out too, but they ain't going to jail. He said, you know what it did? It had the unintended consequence of creating a hothouse where the black musicians traded ideas with each other. And out of that, comes bebop out of that comes miles out of that comes cold train it wasn't you know when we're together and we doing our thing without regard to whoever else is doing whatever and anybody want to join us can come but you're not going to displace this conversation you know what comes out of that the stuff that built the pyramids the stuff that created math and art and science the stuff that created the possibility of an american future brother will Moore, it ain't the founding fathers it's them africans that came and said no Everybody sings, everybody dances in our culture, which means then, of course, everybody votes. And the white people like, huh? Yeah. See, we didn't learn that from George Washington and them. We learned that from a culture, a way of knowing that says everyone participates. So we didn't learn the promise of democracy and said, I want to be like George Washington. Fool! George Washington got his wife, Katie, and vote. You showed up and said, look, I'm kicking in the door, everybody vote. And you know who then turned around and said, oh, no, women? We wasn't like women shouldn't vote. We said everybody could vote. White people in the 14th Amendment, y'all talking about the 14th and 15th Amendment, they say, okay, everybody, no, not women. So the white women say, we want to vote. And then Susan B. Anthony and them, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and them, Alice Potter, they're like, yeah, don't get a vote to Sambo before you give it to your wives and daughters. And then the black women are like, oh, chief. So are y'all making up this solidarity between black women and white women in the fight for the 19th Amendment? 
y'all better go do some study and don't be writing them books where you tell the truth and then at the beginning at the end try to make it about democracy this is about human institution building and leave it to karen hunter to create a space where we can be as human in the world as free in our truth and watch what happens the whole thing gonna shift the whole thing gonna shift karen well, I, I hope so. And um, I'm trying to share my screen, so I'm going to jump out. Oh, but oh really? In addition, no, I'm not. I'm not. Because I think people should go around and kick the tires. And, you know, again, Look, I'm this, looking is, to this, see. <laughs> this, is, this is a vision manifested, right? It started with a conversation and then there's ad. And, and, and for everyone who wants to create something, you can't do anything by yourself. No. I don't care how brilliant you are. No. I don't care how smart you are. No. We need each other. You know, we need... We need to, I prayed about bringing people in who were equal, if not better, in the areas and expert in their areas, because yeah. I don't want to do what you do. I, and and I, and I do. can't do what you do. <laughs> I can't do it. Everybody get, get, get in your position, grab the baton, pick it up, run, figure out if there's something missing, what else is missing. You know, yes. we're going to think tanks in there. I already had this idea about world building or city building, wherever we are in the world, everyone lives somewhere. Let's have these think tanks because the Heritage Foundation has them and they determine who our elected officials are and what the policies are going to be. Why are we doing that work? Why are we doing that work? Of course, there'll be book clubs. Of course, there will be book clubs. Carr and I are already, Dr. Carr and I are already talking about the books every month that we're going to, of the 50,011 books that you hold up during the course of a class. And here's the other thing. Uh, no longer do you have to hold up a book. I know that is your, you, you love to go no, grab. No, 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 it just so have my have them here. Most of my yes. stuff I don't. So, but you, any, book you mention, any book you mention, every single video is annotated. Carl, uh, excuse me, Uraeus and I, well, Uraeus did more than I did. Took about six, seven hours per video to did actually. Y'all hear that? That's a lot of books, uh, Professor Hunter. Wait, wait, help me. Wait, she froze. So when you go and look at this video, you're going to be able to follow. Like we're talking now, it's annotated in real time. So you can pause it. You see the book. You can, And that's just the point of entry, because I'm telling you all right now, I know for the, the classes I'm going to be involved in, we we doing a deep dive. Now, I don't care whether you're six years old, 60 years old, 90 years old, a teenager. Come on in. We're going to walk through this. This is how we're going to do it. Um, I think Professor Hunter may be frozen and I don't want to say too much more because I've seen, obviously, uh, the promised land. <laughs> and I'm going to get there with you. I'm going with you. I'm, I'm on the other side now. And so I think she's probably going to come back in. So I do want to mention a couple of other things since we've been talking about this in the context of the United States versus Billy Holiday and the Amen documentary, the one on Hulu, the other on Amazon, uh, uh, on um on Netflix, we are in a context, in a moment in not only the history of the United States, but the history of the world, where the future of the species is at stake. So what we're really talking about is having a space where we can have honest and candid and frank conversations that will then trigger the real work, not the real work. I don't want to make a distinction between real work and not real work, because see, study is real work. I often hear this. People say we read and we study. When are we going to do something? That is doing something. That is allowing us to begin to anchor so that we all don't have to agree. We all will not agree because the great, the great creative intelligence of our collective is shaped by real study, debate, discourse, and then action and testing the things we've learned. We know a lot of what works and we know a lot of what doesn't work. Ah, I think she's coming back in. Let me see. I had to be careful on this. All right. Well, let me mention a couple of other things then just while we're we're waiting on uh, Professor Hunter to rejoin us. Um, one of the things about the narrative platform that I find intriguing is its capacity uh, to really have us learn at our own pace. Believe me, I'm very grateful for the fact that we are together on Saturdays for the time that we're together, that folks come in. And, you know, it's really not question to answer. We have in dialogue because, again, God knows I don't know everything. The more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And I'm grateful for we are all grateful for the conversations we have where we're learning. And on the other side, on the narrative platform, one of the features will allow you to not only learn at your own pace, but to uh, have access to modules, 
to have guided study. Um, the curriculum we did for the Philadelphia public schools, the African American history course, which I think is the, um, it's the only methodology based model for Africana studies that I've seen. And I have a PhD in Africana studies. I'm only mentioning that to say that I'm, I'm not saying that because that's important, except to say the school I went to temple was the only place in the country at the time you could get a PhD in African American studies. Most people who are doing African American studies in the academy are not doing African-American studies. They're not doing African studies. They're studying black stuff. And then they just put the label over it. Since we study black stuff, but on the narrative site, we're going to get into the how. How do you approach study? That's different than just accumulating some trivia. I mean, yeah, hey, along the way, you'll be able to destroy everybody in trivia night when it comes to black stuff. But that's not the goal. <laughs> the goal is not just acquiring a lot of facts and showing people. No, no. It's beginning to think differently about how we think about ourselves in the world. But you back. So please go ahead. Prop. Well, first of all, the fact that my computer jammed in mid sentence tells me that we are on to something. Oh, no. Question. That didn't happen. No so question. thank you. Thank you, Universe, for being scared. Um, yes. Secondly, yes. Well, this is not like Khan Academy because there's nothing like this. And that's I'm purposeful. You know, we were we were talking. Um, they, <laughs> there's a bookstore in there. So there's like 100 every place that you live. You can click on a city and find a bookstore in your area that's black owned. Right. So we did that. There's a comprehensive bookstore in there. There's a library. We did a bibliography of all of the books. So you don't have to write them down anymore. And every video is an annotated. So Carr mentions Hazel Scott. There's going to be a Hazel Scott picture you click on the picture it'll take you down a rabbit hole it's amazing but as i'm you know as i'm doing this it you know he put black bookstore and i was like why are you putting black on there it's a bookstore mm. we are so conditioned we it's are not like anything even you know calling you i don't want to call you a master teacher you're not a master we don't do masters Mm. We don't do that in our culture. This is about relearning and remembering who we are it and is. how we communicate and how we love one another and how That's we right. spread information. That's right. So That's it's right. it's going to be reprogramming. Some people are going to be uncomfortable. It's not like anything because I don't know too many woke ass black, and I don't even want to say woke because I don't even like that either. <laughs> no we never sleep. We're just either on this side or the other. Yeah, and, and and please understand that all this conversation about woke old folks to tell you you need your rest. So this whole like if you awake all the time, you not only sleep deprivation. That's when you fall asleep at the car at the wheel or do whatever you got to do. Come on now, this is not no. This ain't about wokeness. This is not about ideological rigidity. There's no one perspective, no one point of view. Like when you mentioned Hazel Scott, uh, uh, Professor Hunter, imagine. Listen to this conversation. Then you go on the other side. You see, uh, and then you see annotation. Let me click this. Oh, I'm learning about Hazel Scott. There are a couple of books. There's a very good biography of Hazel Scott. It came out about six, seven years ago. To, but more importantly, it a c connection of Hazel Scott to all the institutional formation she was in, all the people. And here's the beauty. This is why I'm in. In the conversations we've been having, just the conversations we have after we finish our conversation and, and other people come in, and then looking through social media looking through the chat and youtube somebody out there is going to finish a sentence but saying oh my grandmother used to talk about hazel's you know my grandmother brought hazel's got her dry cleaning i didn't even know i just knew it was this lady who lived it and y'all go we're gonna narrate this together yes and that's the and that's the other fundamental difference this is not us talking to teaching you no this is us teaching one another no you know this as goes I, the game of all them let me tell you, documentaries is gone you understand <laughs> I, and let me tell you why I'm, I'm really excited dr carr because it, it is humbling every day I come, we come in here every saturday to see how many people care about knowing things you know all over the globe and it and you, you we didn't know you know half the time you don't even know how many people are here or who's here no. from where, you know, we started doing the Q and A uh, and I'm always fascinated by all the people that you know, cause it seemed like 99% of people who come in, you know them. No, uh, that's, that's years of teaching. That's all. Yeah, but that, I mean, but that's the beauty of it because it shows how interconnected we are. It shows mm -hmm. how much we are one circle, one family, and that family needs to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm asking everybody and I've told y'all to, you know, save your coin, do this. But I see none. Y'all don't listen. Y'all still. I appreciate it. I appreciate. It. I'm not saying you know. I don't appreciate the cash apps or whatever. But this is more important to to sign up for a narrative subscription because this is where 
this is where it happens. This is where we make the film and the documentaries and the cartoons and the children's books and all of the things that we need to be healthy and whole as a group of people collectively. And we're not just talking about people with melanin. Everyone needs to know. No question. The truth. And also where we build community, where we have safe spaces to have conversations. And, you know, I look at all of the toxic spaces where people form insurrections on their spaces. This is where we form freedom villages. No you know, this is where we form community. Y'all busy in tearing down ish. We gonna build some stuff up. Yep. So so is it gonna be uh Professor Hunter, um I'm thinking about those those uh those ads that come on YouTube, oh master class, blah blah. So and then it's like what five hundred dollars, four hundred fifty dollars, seven hundred fifty dollars and so are we talking about that range? No, it's uh, uh, the introductory, you know, for the first uh, month, which we're doing for, because I need us to, this is how you figure out, kick the tires. Is, is there, you know, is there a hole here? What, you know, what's missing? Let's, this is the, the month where we really figure out whether this thing works or not whether it works, but how it functions and can it function better? $99 for the entire year. Wait, the entire that's year. It? For the year. For, for the, the year. year. For the year. See yeah. what, what um, is that black history, black history, the study of black history should be 12 months a year and February we stop. So you saying you launching this right at the end, which means the beginning of the time we supposed to. So by this time next year, by next February. Wow. OK, uh, I think the promo code is our stories. Is that correct, brothers? The, the brothers in the chat uh, is our stories is the promo code. Uh, so put the promo code our stories. I'll put everything in the description of this video. One our word. Yes, one word. O U R S T O R I E S. Our stories. Our stories. One word. Our right. stories. One word is the promo code. Right. Our stories. All right, I'm lo I'm looking forward to this. Uh, more importantly, you know, we were talking about getting them books out your home and out the storage and putting them in a the library. I'm like, we're gonna build that. You know what's so oh. funny about that? You say that, Prof. I'm telling y'all, and this is this is from somebody who, like everybody listening, you know, given whatever space we could be anywhere doing anything we want. I am so ready. If y'all think these Saturdays have been interesting and pull you in with the arsenal complete in one place, this this like the first grade. <laughs> because I mean, as if we tell even the Billy Holiday thing, anything I just mentioned a few books of the 40 that have been published. I probably got 35 of them. I know you do. <laughs> this is my point. <laughs> so I'm saying, and I'm not saying that for me. I'm saying anything, anything y'all see in this background. These books been bought one at a time by a black man who came out of black working class family who works at a black institution, which means that ain't the kind of money we talk about. The only way we're going to make this work is that everybody do a little, everybody got to do a lot. And imagine a place where you can send your children in the summertime and we got enough room, sit down, we're going we're gonna to do this research. We got this bank of computers here and it all feeds back into the narrative piece. Next thing you know, Netflix is like, did that documentary y'all dropped last uh, week on Hazel Scott? Can we, uh, well, here's the licensing fee for that. And then it turns back into some more acreage. I mean, I'm just thinking, look, we got to get free. And we got Africa, we got the Caribbean, we got Europe, we got Latin America, and we got people who are doing stuff everywhere already. We don't reinvent the wheel. No, we got people who've been saying, wait. In fact, people who, who are already saying, wait, is this it? I've been waiting on y'all. Oh my God. We talked about jail breaking. Mm -mm. It's about to be done. And the building, we're going to build the per -onk. That's what the Egyptians call their libraries, per -onk. per -onk translates as literally the house of life. Mm. Per -onk. Oh. <laughs> That's what knowledge gives you, the house of life. They said, we built, you go in the, you go in the Egyptian temple, they got a little room. This is where we keep the scrolls. Alexandria comes late after the Greeks get there. They're on the coast. And so when we talk about the Library of Alexandria, we're talking about it because the Greeks and then those who went and invented the Greece to give themselves glory, which is basically modern Europe, they saw oh, the Library of Alexandria. Man, that's so late. As John Henry Clark said, Egypt was old and tired by the time they have a repository of Alexandria. They've been building libraries since they came out the equator. And they call them the per -onk, the house of life. We're building a house of life on the other side. So come on, Leon, do, do this with you mentioned um, inspiration actually was Carter G. Woodson. Now, mm -hmm. Fubu was an iteration of that. But, you know, you talked about this in a class that Carter G. Woodson went to school kids and they put 
Oh. And you know, they put five on it oh my God. To, to fund what he was able to do. And to this day, we only have a Black History Month because of the work that that man did. Because Thank of Carly you. Woodson. Yeah, in fact, I'm so glad you said this because, again, I took the dust jacket off. So I kept touching it, right? The Miseducation of the Negro. Y'all see at the bottom? The Associated Publishers Incorporated. 9th Street, Washington, D.C. Copyright 1933. This is the first edition. This was a book that was published by black people out of a black institution. The Associated Publishers was crowdsourced, black people. Carter Woodson wrote grants. He received some grants. Phelps Stokes Fund, Rockefeller got some grants. In the early 30s, that money started drying up. By 1933, he wasn't getting it. Woodson had already always encouraged, encouraged black folk to donate to the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History, Negro Life and History then. Um, and he built that notion of Negro History Week as we come to the end of this February around this notion that we're all telling our stories. He says, send us your documents. We'll publish them. And he did in the journal Negro History, this kind of thing. So anyway, when that money, that little bit of money he was getting, because he said, <clears throat> when they give you money, they also want to tell you what to write, what to do. Fast forward to 2021, what to say and what not to say in the narrative. They right. interview you for six hours. They put 30 seconds in. You mad, but it ain't your documentary. They paid for that. Woodson went to the churches. He went to the Prince Al Masons and the Order Eastern Star. He went to the community centers. He went to the fraternities and sororities. He went to the regular black folk in the segregated schools. He said, you know what? Subscribe to the Negro History Book. You had school children. I got a quarter on it. I got a dollar on it. I got a nickel on it. And then Woodson says, when you do that, that means that I'm up two o'clock in the morning. I'm up mailing stuff off. I work for us. I now work for us. Your investment means your owner. Think, just think straight capital. This is a corporation, except it's the people's corporation. Who owns it? We do. And everything we, and that gives us a freedom. Trust me, some of the very people who have been involved in some of these projects that get edited and they get edited out and get mad and we talk, they call me or they email me, hey, what I said, or I said something, you know what? I know you've been waiting. I know you've been waiting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know you've been waiting. <laughs> All right, well, here we go. Yeah, that's, uh, this is it. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. And so your raise is going to give just a quick tutorial because we have people that want to ask questions and, you know, we're going to pay back yes. Yes. to the people yes. that want to come in and ask questions. But take yes. us to a video, please, quickly. Okay, the promo code is not working. That is uh, disturbing to me. Is it capitalized, Carl? Because I keep asking that, Carl, in the chat. Please put that in there if you can hear me. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Promo code's got to work. Promo code's got to work. It's all good. All right. They built pyramids a couple of million stones. It took them 20, 25 years. We ain't going to get caught up in 20 minutes. <laughs> it's going to be all right. Oh, yo. Okay. Are y'all not sleeping? Now, see, now I'm worried about you not sleeping. That looked like the one we did two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Uraeus didn't sleep. I think it took him seven hours to do uh, episode 50. Capital O, capital S in the promo code. Not sure why it wasn't all caps. Not sure why it wasn't all small. But I'm not going to belabor that. Capital O, capital S in our stories. Let's uh, so just capital click on. So capital O-U-R, capital S, T-O-R-I-E. Yeah, capital O, capital S. Thank you, uh, Cam in Chicago, South South Chicago. Uh, was uh, that uh, Cam? All right. Oh, look at that. Okay, that's you. Um, looking nice. Damn near the last time I was in the uh, <laughs> in the let's library. Be, let's be clear. Oh, 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 right. oh, oh. Hey, y'all. Y'all think I'm playing? See, they've been working on this. So I'm laughing because I'm seeing it with y'all. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's be clear. Oh, Theophilo Benga. That's a, that's an Obenga quote. Anytime you say, let's be clear, you got to drop the hammer. All right. All right. So this is the video. You come into that video. Um, what you'll see is a table of content. Whoa. So you know how you take us around the world, but you always come back. And it's amazing. I'm right. fascinated. I sit here fascinated. Like, where is he going to go? And then is he going to remember? And then you remember to come back. That's John Henry Clark and, and old music training. I, th right. I think I think like jazz, but John Henry Clark said, I'm going to go around the topic to get to the topic. So that's just, that's that's classic giant Clark training. 
So throughout the video, every time you mention a, an inflection point, there's going to be a table of content that can take a person right there. So if they only want to know uh, something about Fred Hampton uh, or if they just want to know, and yeah. I can see that this is really small and my eyeballs are not uh, trained, but you go in and there's a whole table of content. When so you the, white, play, the white dot is, uh, it's almost like reading music. The white dot is like the measure in music that takes you to that point. Takes you right to it. So got it, got uh, it. the ninth table of content, you go, you click on it, it'll take you right to that point. And then everything in between the white dots is what's discussed between those two points. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and hit hit play, hit play, hit nine, go to play. And then as you're talking, Dr. Carr, hit play, the play. Um, you'll be mentioning something. And I want to get to the point where he mentioned something so that something could pop up. Now, y'all did show me one of the videos. So just letting people know this is not what it looks like. This is all the bandwidth we're taking. And when you get over there, it's smooth. Right. Yeah, because it is taking up a lot of bandwidth over here. Yeah. Yeah, screen. I don't know what. Uh, all right. So you'll be talking about something. You'll be bringing up a book or you'll bring up something and then there'll be a pop up. And the pop up, when you click on it, will pause and then it will take you to a link oh. like that. Right. So you talk. You must have mentioned Mary Wilson. <laughs> and then she popped up. Click on you. Click on Mary Wilson. It'll take you to. A whole oh. thing about Mary Wilson that you can go down this, wow. this thing. It's her, you know, her death, but NPR, you know. And and just so y'all know, because y'all know now, that they, they, if I if I if they had had Ritalin and all that stuff when I was in school, I might not be sitting here because they probably would have drugged me for OCD oh. or something like that. But I'm saying, constantly as I'm watching this, I'm thinking about what I didn't say. Let me tell so you, he's gonna be constantly um, updating stuff. So please, they tried to put me on Ritalin. Did they? They did. And my father was like, you must be out your thing of mind. You Wait are not going to yeah, yeah, because yeah. you are a lazy ass teacher. You better give her more work. That's what he told me. Come on. That's what he told him. See, that's why I learned. And look, Sergey schools, bad. Legally, bad. However, in terms of culture, you know what the you know what those great school teachers, those black school teachers would do? Somebody like Professor Hunter or myself, they would say, they would make them the assistant. Come up here. Stand next to me. <laughs> Rub your back now. I need you to take the erasers and then, or come at let me tell you, I had a teacher, Miss Johnson, in the fifth grade. She made me a crossing guard. Every morning I had to go get her paper. Come on. She, yeah, because she knew I got to keep this child active because no, she would disrupt the whole ass class all the time. <laughs> and she gave me responsibility. And that's what good black teachers do when thank they you, care about the kids, your abs children. You're absolutely right. All right. Yeah. Let's, uh, thank you, Uraeus, for that. Y'all can go down your own rabbit holes. And well, no question. Huh? And there, how many? They're, they're almost all. Almost all of them are in there. Again, it takes about seven hours to annotate. So, you know, uh, well, I think about it. We got some people. Listen, y'all. Not as good as. Well, we see all the time. No question. When, when y'all go and look, like when I mentioned some of the comedic stuff and things like that, we got people who are not just the best in the United States. We're talking about the best in the world. The top of the food chain for everything we talking about looks like us. And these are the people who they don't call because. They also know how to talk in a way you can't edit out the truth. But now we don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. I mean, so now, so when y'all want to know some Egyptian stuff, I'm telling you, think about this. Some of y'all saying, man, I, oh, translating hieroglyphs, that must be hard. Not, mm -mm, not the teachers we got. Y'all want to learn how to do it? Come on. That way you ain't worry about putting them tattoos on not knowing what they say. <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? So we so got let's 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 get some questions in. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. We, I'm, we, I'm gonna go to uh let me see, let me see. Uh all right, because Alex, you better show yourself uh if I'm gonna bring you in or else I'm gonna go to the next person. All right, right. Let's, here. All right. Hey, hey, Alex, Alex hey. From Portland. You know what oh. happened? Is everything good? Everything's good. Right. All right, yeah. The I uh, was City, on my lap I was on my laptop and it crashed. And so now I'm here on my phone. So, uh, yeah. Good. How you doing, Dr. Carter? I'm, man, I'm better now, man, sitting with you, brother. So how did you get from Kansas City to Portland? Because I see you repping the folk up there, Jayhawks, the Royals, and the Chiefs. And the, and the Kansas City Monarchs. Which is, the, which is the reason for all of it, right? I mean, the way I understand it, the Monarchs is why they named them the Royals, named them the Chiefs. It came from the Monarchs. What's the brother's name? Yeah. The guy he passed away. Ewan Kaufman, I guess, was the owner of the Royals. The original yeah. owner of the oils, and when they 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 said, you know what, the monarchs is the inspiration. The Negro Leagues is why all them teams is named for royalty out there. Are you from KC, man? I am. I'm from Kansas, Kansas, Kansas. Across, yeah, across, yes, <laughs> yes. 
Kansas, what? Kansas why is that county? Oh my God. You know what? Every time I go to Kansas City, we pull in, you can see it. And if you didn't know, if you're not from there, you think it's all no, that's Kansas City, Kansas, right across there, right? That's where they had Jackie yeah. Robinson, I think. Well, well, Leavenworth is in Kansas, right? Yes, Leavenworth. Yeah. Yeah, I think my grandparents are, are, Jackie are buried Robinson. in the cemetery down there. You are kidding. Military? What? Yes. Army. I'm, I'm about to tell you, I'm about to get into that. I have Let me some get out of this. Go ahead, man. Tell me, please tell us. Yes. I have some history for you. So you mentioned about Brown versus Board of Education. And I'm here to tell you and everyone else about the architect of Brown versus Board of Education. Yes, you've been McKinley. talking about this. It's finally good to see you, bro. Yeah, tell us. Hip us to it, McKinley, man. McKinley Langford Burnett. Yes. the architect. He was the president of the Topeka chapter of the NAACP from 1948 until 1963. He is my great-grandfather. He recruited the 13 families, including Oliver Brown, Linda Brown's father, along with his team, Lucinda Todd, who was the executive secretary of the NAACP uh, uh, chapter branch, the yes. lawyers before the lawyers before Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hampton Houston, the people on the ground who did in Topeka, the Scott family law firm. But it was yes. all led by uh, McKinley Burnett, here is a, you know, now I know you're probably not a fan of Walter White because of uh, oh, what no, you said about Paul Wilson. Everybody did what they did. Here's McKin this is McKinley Burnett, right, ooh, wait, right here. Me, right there with Walter with White? Walt yes. Wow. Come on, man. Wait, now he, he's born and raised in Kansas. Yes, sir. He was born in Oskaloosa, Kansas, 1898. Oskaloosa, that's not like a Native American name. Oscaloosa. And he, um, where'd he go to school? In the segregated schools? Uh, 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 well, no, maybe not, huh? Probably Kansas not. I'm actually not sure about that one. But what yeah. I can tell you is he definitely played for the uh, Negro League team, uh, high school team, of course, uh, in you're, Oskaloosa. You're kidding. And uh, he was, uh, how he got interested in civil rights was he, uh, he when he was in high school, Kid. The people used to make fun of the kids used to make fun of him because they said, well, you're black, you know, you can dance and whatnot. And so, you know, you go and dance for us and whatnot. And then he went to the service. He was actually taken out of high school early to go to the service. Just to think of that, graduate him a year early. I just found that out myself just through ancestry. Whoa. And so he went like to the 17? service. And I'm sorry. When was he born? 1898. Okay. So that's the year. Before Jackie Rock, because Robinson was stationed at Leavenworth. He's a Buffalo soldier. By extension, I wonder if they knew each other. Because Robinson was in the military in, in, in Kansas. He was in, he was at Leavenworth. Was was your, was he stationed at Leavenworth? No, he went to. Uh, I'm actually not sure exactly where he went in the in the service. Yeah, but he did all that, and so then he went to. Uh, he um, was in the service. And he would write letters to the president and the uh, Secretary of War at that time. And would ask them to desegregate. He had to read the daily orders, commands to his superior officer who couldn't read. He could read. Come on, man. Come on. He read Come it. On, so Alex. then he got out. He got out. And he this got is, involved with the NAACP. One. Yeah, this is World War I. He got out, got involved with the NAACP, and fought for civil rights his whole life. He is, uh, but the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm coming here today is because he wrote a book about the history of racism in the Republican Party. This is a book we put together. Uh, is it available? It is. It's on Amazon. Now, I'm not on here to, to promote a book to get. No, because I, you know, I got to get a. I got to buy a copy of this book, man. Because I don't yes, have. I will. Sir, so no, I will no, no, send no. you a copy anywhere in the world. I know you. I know you live in D.C. I don't know if you have a mailing address. I know you're all over the place. I don't oh, know. Yeah, if I, yeah, yeah. No, 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 absolutely. Everywhere. I need that, man. So y'all did that. The family. Yes, my great uncle, who's his youngest uh, child, he's 82. Oh, he's still he, alive. Uh, he has two children still living, my great aunt and my great uncle. Oh, that's beautiful. And my, my great uncle uh, put together a book, and he said, I want you to promote this book, and I want you to get in the hands of the right people. And Dr. Carr, you're the right person. I just sent it to, to you. To help me. I put it in the chat. I'm just, I'm just a community college student, so I don't... 
No, ain't no, such, thing is, ain't no such thing is just. We got to uh, have, have you been, have y'all been, I'm assuming that I'm thinking about uh, people like Jenna McNeil, who did the uh, biography of Charles Hammond in Houston. Um, Jose Felipe Anderson's got a new one coming out. James Kanye's new. I'm just thinking about the people who were involved with some of the, wrote about some of the lawyers. Will Haygood, uh, a number of people have written about Thurgood Marshall, obviously. I can't imagine they haven't talked to somebody in your family. The only book that has mentioned it is the book Simple Justice by Richard Kluger. Oh, yeah, I got Kluger's book. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, I got Kluger's book somewhere right around here. In fact, if you go, go to uh, if you go to the chapter Prairie Fire in that book, they talk yeah. all about McKinley Burnett. <laughs> Hold on for yes. a minute. Really? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I'm listening. I'm listening. This is me. Yes. And there so page 392 to 395. Yes, sir. Yes. Wow. But this complete, this really tells the story, what y'all have done. Yes. Then this is, he writes about, it's not, he doesn't write it in this book about the Brown case. It is about the history of racism in the Republican Party from Lincoln. He wrote this, he died in 1968. My God. He wrote this book in 1964, just before the 1964 election. Yes. Talking about the history of white supremacy in the Republican Party from Abraham Lincoln to Barry Goldwater. Oh, wow. You know, there's a couple. There's a book called Plight of the Black Republican. There's been a lot of books recently on that. But, you know, Robinson was a was a Republican. A lot of people were Republicans. So you're but but he saw where it was going in 64. Yes. That's when Barry Goldwater took him into the ditch where they still remain. But but he man, look, where is that manuscript? I have the original manuscript right here. Has it been published? No, this well, this is what we're this is what we're selling on uh, on Amazon. No, that, that, okay, but is, is that? That's but, it his... but it hasn't. It hasn't been professionally published. Okay. And so that's what I'm. That's what I'm coming to you to ask is, since I don't go to a university at the current point, I don't know. I'm not in the loop with people that you know do professional where research the, or whatnot. Well, 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 hold for a second, Alex. Where's Professor Hunter? There she is, as in on cue. <laughs> Unmute yourself. And, and again, you know, hear about it now. That's also very kind of personal, even though it's also instructive. And I, I just want us to be mindful, like there are 50,000 people watching, yes. bringing something in that is very specific to you. Yes. And it's not a general question that we all can benefit from. And the publishing part, car already, you know, is going to be connecting with you. We'll connect with you as well, Alex, if, if this is something that, you know, the team deems, then we'll, we'll follow up. Um, but I thank you for submitting and, and and we'll keep we'll keep you posted hey man all right hey, you know what Your email address in the chat too i'm embar i'm embarrassed right. to say it's been so long since i read simple justice uh now i'm gonna go back and reread that because i see now where, where where it is man that was that, yeah. i mean how could you mm, mm, mm. all right let's bring let's bring this in Thank you. I think, you know this is i mean this this is part of that that thing. you you make some about Cleopatra, Cairo, and all of the Egyptian names, and and then the, the, the chat filled up with people from these places. It's just a oh, connection. Uh, let's bring in Mr. Dennis in Vegas. Oh, from oh. the Bronx. Hey, <laughs> ah, yeah. South, South hey. Bronx. how y'all doing? Hey, Dennis, how yeah. are you, brother? Well, first of all, Hotep to the family. Hotep, Hotep. And for those of you who don't know, Hotep means simply means peace. That's it. It doesn't uh, mean Tepper is like nah. It means peace. So y'all stop, stop. Let people know. <laughs> don't disrespect the word hotel. It's one of the oldest words in human language, recorded yes. language. So, hotel, yes. Bob. It's good to see you, man. Hotel, my brother. Uh, always a pleasure to, to come to class on Saturdays. I look forward to it from the time we stop on Saturday to get back to fall the next Saturday. That's Honest how much man. it blesses me. So. Uh, Honest I need man. to just let you know. I'm just speaking speaking about you last night because I was prepping myself for my class, having my questions laid out. Oh. And I had have an uncle that's an HBCU professor at Payne in Augusta. I know oh, yeah. Falk has family in Augusta. My uncle's been there, uh, a faculty member since 1967. He's still. Oh, there. what's his name? Uh, Dr. Mallory Millender. He's my Mallory uncle. Millender. I know my he, friend Kathy Adams, who's on faculty at Payne. I know that he. I know he knows. Yeah, they already know each other. Yeah, he's oh, been in Professor Millinder. I'm yeah, gonna look him up. Is yeah, he still he's still there? He's still there. He's he was a French professor for countless years, and now he's in administration. <laughs> but he's he's still on campus. He's still there. Yeah, That's he's beautiful. Been there almost please, almost give him, please give him my respect and admiration. Uh, Payne turned the corner, man. They was they looked yes. like they was trying to snatch their accreditation, but they they're solid yes. now. 
They're solid now. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. Uh, he's doing well. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, born and raised in the Bronx. I'm, I'm from New York. That's what, that's what my my parents and my mom is from is from Birmingham, as they call it when she was coming up. We don't already call it Birmingham. <laughs> Out of my and hill, my, brother. Yes, no sir. question. You, and Sonia I, Sanchez, and Angela Davis, man, and your mom. No yeah, question. my mom and them, and my dad is a, is a geeky from South Carolina. So uh, they both went on to be with the ancestors now. But um, I say they uh, they have they were they met in Harlem, you know, and that's where uh, they they came together in the, the Renaissance period. One of the capital. Went, oh, the Renaissance. Yes. Oh, they go, yes. you old, they go back, back. Yeah, yeah, my parents go back. They're older people. But I'm going to say, I want to share this with you. I, I'm older than, yeah, than please, I look. Probably, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my 60s. I'm an old man. But I want to share this with you because I want to I wanna make time for somebody else. Um, your library is, 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 is inspiring. What you and Karen here is inspiring. I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Just keep, as, as Brother Kaba would say, keep on keeping on. We ain't going to stop till we win. No, that's, that's I love that brother. I've been on him for about an hour or so because we still just blessed to me just the things he shares, and you know him. I ain't got to go any further. Oh, yeah, Baba Cabo, man. Well, no question. He you talk about knows his one stuff. Of our we love that brother. stuff. No, but I'm gonna question. share this question with you because I want I want to I want you to open up about it and then move on to the next person. I want to hog time, but no, my Baba, question to you is that well, we're connected now, so yeah, you know, we can be together, yes, sir, <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, but the question is as follows it's pretty simple. Um, I watched you earlier this week on um. On uh, the show with uh, brother Roland. Oh, Roland, and yeah. Tapped, Roland. And, and, you, and you tapped on something that I that I formally agree with you on. Just want to be clear that this basically this country is pretty much it's pretty much done. You know, it's a matter of time. Um, I totally concur. But I my it's question like was this: in the world, <laughs> I yeah, mean, it's, it's, exactly, exactly. It's it's not you know, permanent. Right? Yeah, yeah. This, this empire is about to come down. But uh, my question is: uh, oh, oh, my question is why aren't uh, we as a people, black people? asking or should we be asking instead of demand we should be demanding human rights in opposed to civil rights mm -hmm. um as a as an older brother like i said i'm in my 60s in my lifetime i, I remember the civil rights struggle i remember going to church at the old uh william institutional there on, on lennox uh to yeah. hear king speak when i was a child i remember going and seeing him when i was when i was a little boy um, Come on, I, Come on. oh yeah i was there i I, rem I remember seeing adam clayton powell i remember seeing not from one of the corners of Harlem. I remember those days as a kid, as a child. Um, but the reason why I, I'm going in this direction, because I, I just, this is what I feel, that we're going in the wrong direction as for civil rights. We should be asking for human rights. Yeah. Um, this is a human rights violation, what's being done to us as, as a people. That's right. Um, and I want to see if you agree with that, due to the fact that they are committing genocide on our people. It's not, as far as I'm concerned, it seems to me, the United Nations should be addressed in this, in this, in this matter. Uh, concerning uh, its uh, its high commission on human rights through this commissioner, Ms. Michelle, I think her name is Bachet. But my point is this. I feel that we should be looking at the direction of human more so than civil because, see, that's their loophole. Because the, the, civil, the civil rights, they, they, they ain't worried about that. But when nope. we come out on human rights, uh, right. we're, looking at, we're looking at a whole other can of worms here they don't want, they don't want to see open. That's you know, exactly so I just want, I'm gonna stand back and let you answer that. But that's what that was no, my question. No, uh, Dennis, Dr. Thank you, man. And listen, I put I put uh my email in the, the thing in that the you said. Okay, yeah, okay, let's talk, man. So so okay. first of all, thank you, uh Bob Dennis. And you're right, when, yes, when we yes, were sir. talking on Thursday, uh brother Roland, again, part of this network building independent conversations. Yes. As you remember, we were we were talking about um the uh the cops getting off, another set of police getting off, right? Exactly. And and you know. Because you were there, I mean, you're in New York. Malcolm came back when they after they shut him out, wouldn't let him land. You know, and then he's back in New York, and the press conference when he's getting off the plane there in the city, it's like, so you want to take the United States up before the United Nations? He said, "Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes." And so the history of our people show that it's both and. And Dennis, this is so important, brother, because. With the current reparations conversation that we're having now, one, by the way, that is an unbroken demand that we've been making since we were abducted and not right. a demand that's anchored in belief in America. But as you say, this 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 expansive concept of humanity, uh -huh. if you are indeed a human being, then what you have done is a moral crime. We're not talking about a statute. We're not talking about the common law. We're talking about a moral crime, a crime against exactly. humanity. The same kind of thing you want to bring the Germans up, and rightfully so, the Nazis mm -hmm. at Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. The 
same thing. You want you want to you want to enforce it, except when it comes to you. And so, uh, right, right. You know, exactly. and so, so we know that um, for every discussion as Canada, we were talking about the Civil War and all this kind of thing. We mm -hmm. know that France and England set out the war in part because they wanted to see who was going to win. Because mm -hmm. the Confederacy had told them we could run out of Charleston, just like we could do it out in New York. They said, oh, okay. But we know that by the time we get to the, um, even during the Civil War, when Martin Delaney is like, Martin Delaney leaves Nigeria, goes to London, and it's like, you know, he's 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 a member of this International Explorer Society. James Buchanan is the president of the United States. Members of the Buchanan administration are in, are in England, and they're looking at this African who was born in West Virginia, raised in Pennsylvania, uh, a friend and also a, a, an arguer with Frederick Douglass and them, who has gone beyond the United States, like Douglass did when he went to England, talking about abolition. And the, and the, and the Buchanan administration is like, what are you doing over here? Martin Delaney is like, hey, basically, I'm a citizen of the world. So what you're not going to do is keep this shame bottled up in the United States. Arguably, there are not even arguably there are, are there have always been international pressures on any individual country. And, and so that country's domestic policy is shaped by, in part, international policy. The United States Civil War is shaped by international forces. The United States hadn't even finished its settler colonial project to the Pacific Ocean. Let me fast forward right quick because I know we're going to get to the next person. When you get to the 20th century, right before you come on the planet, right before I come on the planet, Professor Hunter come on the planet, but when our parents are alive, your parents are in New York when William Patterson, Louis Thompson Patterson, Paul Robeson, Eslanda Robeson, Shirley Graham Du Bois, W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, William Alphaeus Hunton and his wife. In fact, oh, I'm I'm naming these. I'm thinking about them. I'm looking at the books over here. Gerald Horn's book, uh, Black Revolutionary. You can read uh, Shirley Graham writing about this. Du Bois writing about this. They had a newspaper. Paul Robeson had the Freedom newspaper. Then Lorraine Hansberry come on them come along. Uh, Harold Cruz writes about some of this in Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. But there are books like. Um, Penny Von Eschen, Race Against Empire, uh, books dealing with the Council on African Affairs. In fact, The Unsung Valiant is the book that Alphaeus Hunton's wife does about her husband. They, the UN has founded in 1945. Miriam Clyde Bethune is there, you know, Ella Roosevelt now, Du Bois, and them saying, you know what? Let's take the United States up on human rights abuses because they have a convention against genocide. And they say you are you are committing genocide against black people in this country. Genocide doesn't mean you killed everybody, but genocide means you've targeted the members of the group. And that includes lynching. That includes uh, the kind of things they're doing to us today. They meaning the United States government. So they put together a petition and I got a copy of it over here, but I'm going to I'm going to resist the urge to go get it called We Charge Genocide 1951. They deliver copies in Geneva. William Patterson and them are dispatched. In fact, William Patterson is in, I think it was Paris, if I remember correctly. And Ralph Bunch is over there because Ralph Bunch is one of the people who's working with the UN. And William Patterson is like, I'm in the room. I'm with all these people. They looking at me all nervous because I'm the American Negro and I'm airing dirty laundry in their mind. I see Ralph Bunch. Bunch turns his back and walks away from me. Why? Because you know, Ralph. While you over here trying to negotiate what ends up being the formation of the state of Israel and get the Nobel Prize, you got black people who are like, yeah, what about at home, bro? And that's not to say Bunch wasn't with that, but Bunch realized that domestic policy is shaped by foreign policy. So for me, it isn't, and for us, I think, it isn't just either or, it's both. So what we're calling civil rights in the United States are really human rights applied through the small prism of citizenship. That's why when you watch a documentary like Amend and they start with citizen, no, you just narrow the lens. That doesn't mean that citizen isn't important. It's essentially important in a state formation. However, when you divorce citizen or when you elevate citizen over human, you then make it an in-house conversation. And so that's when the state moves against those black people who are doing that. That's where you see, for example, Van Dunn Conference, 1955, Adam Clayton Powell goes, but Adam Clayton Powell in part is trying to negotiate between uh, uh, the United States government and say, he's trying to go over there to kind of keep things tamped down. But he's also, what are, what are y'all doing over here? Because Powell understands he's trying to walk a thin line. However, you got Robeson's and the Du Bois's and them, they take their passports. During the 1950s, y'all can't travel. Why? Because y'all out here talking about the United States. They jumped on Paul Robeson for the Paris Peace Conference in 1940. What was that? Seven. But at any rate, no, 45. But the point is this. That's when you see the civil rights organizations in the United States 
scared. People gonna call them communists, scared. They kind of turn their backs, not completely. You read Carol Anderson's book, uh, Bourgeois, was it Bourgeois Revolutionaries? Gerald Horn and them, of course, have written about this. Uh, uh, what's the sister's name? Carol Anderson wrote a book called Eyes Off the Prize. And earlier when we were talking, talking about Walter, mentioned Walter White. Walter White and them are going to go with Harry Truman and them. Truman, by the way, who was the president when this guy was persecuting Billy Holiday. Truman and them, they're going to push anti-communism and try to keep this thing bottled up in the United States. But they can't. Why? Because the Russians, the Chinese, all this African liberation movement going on, the Caribbean liberation movement going on, Latin America going on, Cuba takes its independence in 1959. It's very important. The United States can't prop up 10 horn dictators like uh, 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 Papa Doc Duvalier in Haiti, for example. They're going to pop up. They're going to they, they're going to take Papa Doc out until the Cuban Revolution, at which point you got a problem because Castro comes to New York, right where you from, Harlem, and stays at the Hotel Teresa, and here go Malcolm X sitting next to him because he's like, yeah, man, I'm in solidarity with them. Now you got some decisions to make. So what does the United States do? What do they start doing in the 50s? They start giving some concessions to those black folk who are fighting in the courts, who are beginning to march in the streets. That's when you see Brown versus Board of Education. You don't get a Brown versus Board of Education un unless you've got these other black people raising the international issue of human rights. That's when you see, and those are concessions that to this day are read in these documentaries as, see, this is America perfecting itself. No, that is American domestic policy being shaped by people going outside and beyond America. And so I'll end with this because we got the whole history. It's just a little bit of taste. Y'all come on over to the narrative side because it ain't just me. We're going to then play this whole thing out. And the, way, and the way Professor Hunter got it set up, you know, we'll probably have a little conversation on the other side. We'll get some of these people, get Gerald, get Carol Anderson, wait down, and then have people get into the conversation and understand the whole American descendants of slavery conversation, for example. I understand it. I embrace it. However, I think it can be enhanced. It has to be enhanced by the knowledge that there hasn't ever been a domestic policy demand and struggle, a so-called citizen or civil, meaning citizen, civil rights demand. And I don't care whether it's black or brown people. I don't care whether it's people who the border crossed, as Malcolm said, instead of they crossed the border. Citizenship, all that citizenship becomes a thing that excludes. And it creates a, a it creates tears of humanity. There's never been a domestic policy advance for our people that wasn't coupled with this country casting an eye toward how it is perceived internationally, what it will do internationally, and as the economies of the world continue to shrink and and and, and sink, as migration patterns continue to overwhelm white folk in Europe, in this country domestically foreign policy is only going to be more important. So any domestic policy demands we make in terms of quote unquote civil rights must be placed in the larger context, brother, as you say, of human rights, human rights, human rights. And anybody says different, send them over to the narrative side. Or we'll meet up here for a few minutes every Saturday and talk about it live. And then we carry it over there and bust this thing out because the people in this room right now are international. Drum beat. This is a drum beat. Um, yeah. and, and this is digestion. We got to eat, nibble, keep, nibble. keep eating, nibbling. No question. Can't take it all. In. Some some people, are, they want everything today. Can't so happen. happen. Just hold ahead. We good. We good. Just be patient. Uh, it's all going to come together. How long did it take the pyramid of Giza? 20 years to build? 20, 25 years. And they start when the pharaoh was, uh, was put in position. That's the day they start working on the tomb. Okay, we're working today's day one. All right, today's day one. Let's bring Mr. Bavu in from Austin, Texas. Hey, Bavu. I'm in class. I'm in class. But yes. Bavu, you hear me how you all right? Down there, man, y'all got some spring weather down there finally. Uh, finally, man, we survived. Uh, respect to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to. I, I got to spell some things out because we're connected. We're very connected. You Please know my help. father. You know my sister. What? First of all, I got to say thanks because y'all are building this underground railroad, right? To this, R -R, to, all the way to this sovereign black Netflix of education. Like this oh. makes my heart beat. Like this is it. This is my spot. Sovereign. When I was a kid, like I'm in Texas, my folks, my parents are from the same block on the same street, not even a mile from where Alton Sterling was murdered. But my dad went to Cornell first, then he went to Howard. I'm a Howard baby. So let me show you a couple things. Ooh. When I got this from Eloise Greenfield, oh. she, she signed it. 
this the she vinyl. Did. When she signed it, she said black love with no spaces. When I got Ooh. this, when I was four years old, when I got Man. this, he said, Babu, we are trying to build a world for you. And here it is. I'm here. Look. So when you talk about like the ancestors that y'all are rolling with are no joke. Oh. And when you hey, talk look. about and, the and desire people. to remember, hold on, let me listen to you. Go, 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 Bob. Got you. No, I'm no. just saying I'm, I'm evidence of your claims. That's who I am. Yeah, I'm just making it clear. Like my father is Alvin Blakes from Dallas, Texas, from the oh, third eye. My man, right? And my Naima is say what you say. Naima, she's probably watching. Naima is my sister. Before you finish, before you finish, Bob, yes. please tell us what your name means. My name means force in Kiswahili. Because again, I'm a Howard baby. Doctor Carr, you wrote the intro to my first teacher's memoir that just came out. You talking about Dick, not Dick Gregory? Uh, Mama Nikichi Taifa. Yes, of course. I went to Nation House. I went to Nation House. Wait, you were here in DC. I went to Watoto. Oh then, oh so you 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 yeah. with the, the the great mind of all time. You talking about, a, about the Kotos? Absolutely. <laughs> I heard I heard you mention them. So again, the ancestors y'all rolling with a no joke. When you, when you said you sovereignty, talk, I know I know you know that because I in fact I just talked to Mama Marimba day before yesterday. For we talked for a long. I, you know she was on my dissertation committee. Mm -hmm. Oh oh, brother man, dictator. I heard you. Discipline. I hey, heard man, you. Wait a minute. How old are you, uh, Babu? Forty six. Okay, so then I'm wondering. Cause you know, it was your pops, man. I came down there. Oh, um, how many years ago? Oh, five and oh seven. Oh, five and oh seven. Oh, five and oh seven. So, I'm yeah. trying, did, we, did we meet? Or were you are? Were you? No, I was already in Austin, but he still uses some of your genealogy uh, oh, yeah. framework because that's what he does now. He just retired from Rapid Transit, Dallas area Rapid Transit. Now he's full time. He's that's full time. Hard. He retired two months ago. He's full time genealogy, and he still yeah, uses some of your framework. Look here, man. Still use some of your framework. That, that, that Alvin Blake. Look, man, and your sister Naima, you know, we took we took care of our baby sister when you when when she was here at DC. Oh, yeah. But your man, you your family, hey man, listen, much love and respect because third eye is third eye still going? Third eye is not still going, but they're still connected and studying, but okay. they don't do the okay. African awakening conferences anymore. But I grew up on that, obviously. And so uh, when you're talking about capacity to remember, Brother. like every claim y'all make, I'm the evidence. Like, like it's this is my spot, man. I'm in you class. Are, man. You I are. have an important question for you that's going to yes, bless sir. a lot of people. Yes, sir. But I, I man, I, I got to transition a little bit and say I, I work in education. Oh, yeah. Um, and I really work in the school system because, you know, education is way more important than school. You know this. No question. Um, which is why this exists. Right. That's but right. I work in that area of what's called educational equity. And the powerful sister and mentor, Dr. Angela Ward, had laid 10 years of foundation, even though it was, you know, it was uh, adverse to the system yeah. itself. You know about that. So you probably yeah. know where my question is about to go. But she just left a week ago. So now a lot of us are corporate orphans, but we're carrying on this work. But I'm setting up my question because what I'm asking you is going to bless probably a million people in the United States of America who are working in those equity spaces. Yes, so sir. she left and you know why. So I don't have to explain it. Yeah. But her words, she she left to rest and relax and write. But you know why she left. You know why she left. And so I'm working in educational space. I want to show you one more thing that when I'm reading this Django Paris and Samuel Lee. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm in the back and I'm reading Carol Lee. And my dad is like, do you know who Carol Lee is? And I'm like, no. He's like, man, so people, uh, that's, that's, <laughs> exactly. That's Donnell Lee's wife. I was like, wow. No question. <laughs> so so here's what we're trying to do is this cultivating genius. Right. Which is based on the black literary societies. We're yeah. trying to do this. Y'all need to yeah. have Goldie Muhammad on like tomorrow. We're yeah. trying to do this. But you know that the system is not designed for this. No, not so, at all. Here's but, my but question. This, but, but, this ahead, space is. but this space is. Go ahead. This is my space. No question. I, was just, I, I brought my whole team from work here on like a field oh, wow. trip so they could enter this world. They're watching. Wow. But here's my question because it's, 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 it's based on something I heard you say that I need expansion on. And let me insert real quick the question I'm not going to ask so that maybe you can address that later. Okay. But have you clarified for folks how in the world that Du Bois and Woodson were even able to get PhDs over 100 years ago at Harvard? Can you spell that out at some point? And that's not my question, but I, that's a footnote. So my question is this. You made a very specific comment recently because I live here. You said mm -hmm. the white facing anti-racism and equity institutions uphold racial hierarchy. They uphold cultural hegemony. And if you could explain that, there's a lot of educators and you know how many people are entering that space and how much money is now being oh, thrown right. extra in that space. So there's a lot of people who are going in there. They're not going in there just to get paid. And they're definitely not going in there just to get played. Nope. 
But that's all that ends up happening most of the time is people get paid and they get played. You understand? That's right. So my question to you is, can you please expand and break down how on earth is it that anti-racism and equity is set up to maintain what it originally is supposed to be working against? Yes, sir. It's well, uh, to me, to, first, Brother Babu, man, it's such a pleasure, man, and an honor to be in the conversation. That's, that's first of all. Second of all, man, I'm glad you're here in the team because, you know, on this other side, on the narrative side, you, we got work, man. Mm -hmm. You're bringing all them skills and all that experience and all that grounding, and we're going we're building, which really, to me, is, and I'm going to say to me, let me stop saying to me. I think this is the lesson that you demonstrate with your life mm -hmm. and that I demonstrate with my life. And you've been in it longer than I have, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, you came in from birth. Mm -hmm. I came in from my late teens. So when I think the Institute of Positive Education in Chicago and OBU in San Antonio, I mean, all these formations, you know, I learned about them in college and after. But mm -hmm. you were born and raised in them. And I Can think I interject one thing? Yes, sir, please. I'm named in Black Lawyer, Black Power. Oh, <laughs> she she yeah, mentions us because she's like, don't ever forget, Bavu, that I was your first reading teacher. I'm like, that's my first reading teacher. You see her on TV on C-SPAN trying to get yeah. reparations. That's that's my teacher right there. Everybody's like, word, that's your teacher. But anyway, so you I had this. So you got her children's books. People don't uh, even know. Mama, do. Mama Nikita, she got these yeah. I have them. And you know what? As far as this platform goes, me and my son. So this is oh, this is Bob hey. Alvin's grandson. We have a new joint. For, for 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 y'all, I'll send I it to you. That. I'll send I it to you. That. I got wait your address. Hey, oh, good. You mean so wait, hold on a minute. What's your name, Baba? What's your name, brother? No, I'm Baba. Oh, come here, L. She's talking to you. Is the L is it Ellington? Ellison. Ellison. As Ellison. Baba okay. Flakes. Ellison, Oklahoma. What's Ellison. <laughs> what's up? What's up? Oh yeah, Ralph Ellison from the territory. <laughs> hey, Ellison. Hey, Ellison, how are you, man? How old are you, brother? Yes, ma'am, Miss Hunter. Oh, he said, "How old are you?" He's he's nine. Miss Hunter wants me to, to get to get to my question. Okay, yeah, oh yeah, I got. I oh no, no, no. She said, "Get this to you." Come back, El. Come back, yeah, El. Let me, let me finish. The car has a question. Hey, look, he got his, he, your he, auntie nice college professor. He has he questions. Gotta, he got to sign this, man. So you got. For, will you sign that for me? Uh, okay. I appreciate that, but listen, you're nine. My nephew Ellington. Who is in Houston? Ah, uh, his nickname is L. So when you say L, so <laughs> both mm -hmm. of y'all, man, hey man, it's an honor to see you, brother. I see you got Dame Dollar on your shirt. That's Dame your man. Dollars. <laughs> He's more <laughs> of a Giannis Antetokounmpo cat, but you know. Oh, I sorry. Yeah, you already know, brother. We got, so right. you know, it's you. good to see you, Baba. So 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 the uh, I think the answer we are living demonstration. Of the answer you you know as well as I do. Maybe some people who don't know. You know, we talk about maroonage or marinage, right? With uh -huh, the French uh -huh. call maroon, and then the, the out of the Spanish for wild runaways, right? And mm -hmm. then there, there are two forms, right? There's petite maroonage, and then there's grand maroonage. Grand maroonage is when you just build your whole society. You know, uh, the Palenques or Quilombos in, in Brazil, the mm -hmm. Haitian Revolution, to me, that's, that's grand maroonage. In other words, we're going to take over the whole society. Absolutely. Absolutely. Petite, petite maroonage. Is those cats that would leave the plantation for a day or two mm -hmm. and then go to, you know, and then come back. <laughs> so they were like taking stuff from the place, taking it over to the, to the Grand Maroonish place or going to other plantations. They had husbands or wives, different families. With. And so they didn't leave completely, but they engaged in this kind of form of, uh, of, of freedom practice as best they could. OK, I look at the system that you work in and all these folks, the equity system. I look at it the same way. In some ways, I look at the HBCUs. That's petite maroonage. In other words, we are in formations that reinforce the racial hierarchy, the oppression of our people, and HBCUs unfortunately uh, do some of that because they are they don't they haven't changed the the grounding. That's okay. like you know I'm, we're going to create pipelines for success. What does that mean? We're going to prepare people for the workforce. Okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah, but no, but we're going to create wealth in the black community. Okay, yeah, but. How do it free us? I know how it free right. you. Now, now, <laughs> can I, wait, now you're saying that, and, and, and I feel you because Bettina Love talks about managing, the fact that you're managing inequities is problematic already. But are you saying that it reinforces it by what it fails to do? Or well, are you saying I'm, that what, it by what design? I'm, yes. What I'm saying is absent grand maroonage, absent grand maroonage, absent a space like narrative that we build now, mm. absent a space like the third eye, without the black books, without grand maroonage, Petite maroonage 
is the only thing you have, which okay. means it's only one set of institutions. Mm -hmm. You can never make an oppressive system equitable. What are you mm. even asking? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In other words, I mean, in other words, you know, it's the critique. And, and here's where, you know, those are those are our friends who really get who think about class before race. And I think that they're all commingled, of course. And this is where it gets difficult because I think sometimes we get stuck in these ideological silos and we know it's not that, it's that. Right. No, it's all of it working together. So, mm -hmm. you know, folks will say, America. How do you make something equitable that is based on a fundamental political economy that depends on inequity? That part. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. what does equity mean? Well, equity means, look, if we're 12% as so-called African-Americans of the population, 12% of the supervisors should be black. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's equity. Now, what does that do for these children over here that ain't got no pipeline to get jobs and own their... Well, we're just going to tell them to go to school uh, harder and study harder. No, because you've got a finite amount of resources that you've already reserved for the people who have inherited this, the, the, their, their position at mm -hmm. the top. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you're going to let in a, a LeBron James and a Serena and maybe a couple of uh, Oprahs. And that doesn't, and, and then equity would be what? Well, equity would be, we would give everyone the opportunity to come into this system and, and go as far as their talents can take them. Okay, but you're not changing the structure. No. Okay, mm. now watch this. When you have independent institutions that you've built, mm -hmm. the concessions in those other spaces, they give it up quick. Why? Because the last thing they want you to do is start building your space. And I'm not saying, look, and this, and I think this is where the, this is where the challenge comes in, Babu. Now I'd be interested in knowing what you think about this. Mm -hmm. When we think, and, and Mama Marumba talks about this a lot. She writes about mm -hmm. it in her book Irugu. When we oh, start yeah. talking about, you know, oppositional logic, either or logic. Mm -hmm. This is not the way that we have to ground ourselves. Culture, it's both and. Right, so right, right. Say, you're just gonna walk away from the system. How are you gonna work? No, 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 no. It's both and. You've got to build your and during segregation, during the battle for uh, uh for uh, to destroy Jim Crow, all the all the struggles that were launched came out of black institutions, no matter how compromised or semi compromised they were. Mm -hmm. So. I guess what I'm what I'm going to ask you is when I think of equity work, I think of work that ultimately reinscribes and reinforces the existing structure. If that work is uh, undertaken with no independent black spaces that are being built, <laughs> so, so so is it possible to do equity work? while building black institutions that could in fact expand the transfer of resources, the transfer of brain power, the transfer of skills from that petite maroonage to the grand maroonage. See, you already know me. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> you are, I mean, you just- I mean, hi history tells us it, it does, but but what do you, t t talk to, yeah, t talk to Well, me. I mean, if I'm hearing you correctly, you, you're describing a, a, a bit of a, for lack of a better description, a Robin Hood theory. You no, know, well, you yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Except, mm -hmm. the, interestingly enough, we already have the riches. We just don't count them as riches in a in a, in a capitalist society. Look at Ocean mm -hmm. Hill Brownfield, 1968, the teacher strikes. Uh, last week, was talking to a, a, a great, a major figure, Harold Pates, a retired mm -hmm. uh, retired educator. Him, Anderson Thompson, Barbara Sizemore. Now, they created mm -hmm. something in Chicago, late 60s, called the Association of African Educators. People are coming all over from all over the country, and some of those folks are still alive. But in Brooklyn. The, the delegation that comes to Chicago from Brooklyn, one of the people is a dude named Les Campbell. We mm -hmm. know him, of course, as Baba Jitu Weyusi. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the origins in the East and other of uh, the Council of Independent Black Institutions. But they start as school teachers when they're in a fight over community control in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, District of Brooklyn, because they want their children to have black teachers. They want their children to learn African American history. And the the mm -hmm. teachers union comes for them first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you can't do it. But they don't they don't stop with the demand of for public resource transfers. That's petite maroonage in some ways. Sure. They build independent black institutions. Right. And so when you start talking about EPE, you start talking about uh, the East, you start talking about uh, the schools. And this is where finally we get into this whole conversation around charters and, and finance education and the, the whole wars in the 80s and 90s in places like Detroit. I right. mean, think about the African Senate school movement, Baba Asa, of course, in, in, in the Portland yep. Baseline essays. We lose sight of the fact that 
it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. But that all of the above must include independent institution building, which is why what we're doing is so important. So my right. question to you, brother, is uh, we, we can count on you, right? Absolutely, because that's where I came from. That's where I started. You know, at Watoto, if you showed up with a, with a name like James, they gave you a name like Kwaku. No. You know, I didn't have that issue. But, you know, the first time I met Professor Hunter, we were talking about this concept. And this is where y'all are building this underground railroad to get us to is a Netflix of education. And I don't mean just digital or Internet based. I mean, as soon as you sign in, they look at your whole family context and they show you that they know everybody on your account. Then that's when right. you choose yourself, they that's start right. from wherever you left off and they're not doing late fees for somebody who's behind the system, the average. They're not doing rewind fees for my son who's advanced. Instead, they're doing a responsive educational model for each individual student. No and we need that for black folks because otherwise we know what we get every time we go to the system. So what I am perceiving and receiving out of what you're saying is that I am in my position to learn and I'm in my position to understand. And if I have any doubts about what this system is and I want to keep bumping up against it, then so be it. But at the end of the day, yeah, it's going to be my duty to be part of the Netflix, which is going to be independent and going to be outside because those are not the values or the traditions of the state. That's right. Hey, Amen. It is what it is. We're going to be talking soon. Love yes. to your Baba. Love to your sister. If those of you who want to read more about the East, it's a, Baba, a brother named Kwasi Kanadu who has written the history, a history of the East. He publishes himself, African Diaspora Press. Y'all can look him up. And we are going to do this, brother, because that's what we've yeah. always done. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was reading The Beautiful Struggle uh, by Coates because you know, my, dad used, my dad used to buy books from Paul Coates. Paul Coates home. is the man. For those yeah. of you who thought you read, you read if you all read uh, Between the World and Me, that's all great. Right. If y'all read Black Panther, <laughs> that's great. If y'all waiting on a black Superman, that's great. I love Todd Hossie, my brother. Todd it ain't the case for reparations, though. No, of course not. No, but, but that's his masterwork. Todd Nahasi, the mm -hmm. name Todd Land Nahasi, black. Dr. Ben named Todd Nahasi as his wow. father. Paul Coates mm -hmm. is the man. Paul Coates, Black Classic Press. Read yeah. Todd Nahasi's first book. The beautiful struggle. Yes, he <laughs> names Watoto. He names Watoto, started by Baba Aj and their programs Earth. as the way that he retained his blackness, which led him to the Mecca. He they specifically all names it. He specifically names it as I probably would have been in them streets somewhere if I wouldn't have been able to play those drums with Watoto's program. No so okay, that's where I came from, and that's where I returned to, and that's why y'all are helping me remember what my duty oh. is, and I appreciate it so much. Let me ask you this, uh, uh, brother Babu, because I, I don't know this brother. I only read his stuff. I read his uh, How to Be Black. Was Barra Thunder there? Uh, Thurston, he was there. No, he may be. It may be a little bit. Uh, it may be a little bit. Uh, he, they may be about. They were y'all. So you around your age? I, 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 I can ask my my dad and my mom. They remember everybody. Okay, yeah, I'm sure my they mom do. Was I, a teacher there as well. My mom was a teacher at Watoto too. I, I feel like yeah. I must have met. I must have seen her then. Because uh, you, Carol, you know, you know her yeah. daughter. <laughs> they look yeah, alike. Yeah, of course. Did they come up to? Uh, we were at Baba uh, Baba Aj's uh, ritual. You know, when he made the transition. So they were. They were. Well, he had, and and, and also at my at Naima's graduation, one of uh, Baba Aj's sons was graduating. Oh, yeah, yeah, no question. Yeah. yeah. They all, that's right. They all came out. Oh my I was there. god. Has that been? What has that been like? Thirteen years? Not thirteen. Like it's, ten years. It's been a long time because she is about 32. It has been 10 years, man. I see that look, Professor Hunter. I didn't mean I didn't mean to go. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. We did. 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 We you know, okay. that's I do. I, I'm looking for, you know, a few good men and women. I'm looking mm. for a non-binary. I'm not getting caught up in the politics of that. But we're looking for brilliance, wow. few good brains to do that. And I, I was watching you because you're, you're an educator. I was like, can he come in and teach? Maybe he could teach something. So that's what Dr. Carr is actually saying. The baton is in your hand. That is what so, I'm saying. Uh, so let me thank you. And somebody asked, you know, Karen, you pick great questions. I don't pick at all. It's random. It's random. I, I, I On Friday. If you have a question, DM me. And then I pick the first two or three people who come in. We have one spot open. Babu has been like in the queue. I was like, here's the link. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that you were going to come in and do this and that you knew Car, but of course, everyone knows Car. No. Everyone thank, knows Car. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing. It was brilliant. All of the brothers today. Nice you, questions. Uh, thank, thank you for sharing your son, too. 
Little yeah. Bit. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm a, we're gonna talk off mic, and I'll definitely give you. I'll DM you my information, uh, Doctor Carr. We're I'm gonna. Sorry, I'm sorry, we went over. We were supposed to. No, no it's, it's, listen. There, there's no rating this in because it's not uh, scripted, and we're not. Which is the other strange thing, you know? Uh, someone said, "Oh, someone's gonna copy this." You can't copy this. You just you can't. There's just no way you're going to. No. Good luck trying. It's not going to be authentic. Mm-hmm. These are conversations that I had that neither one of us know where they're exactly nope. going to go. Nope. And I believe that there's so much more spiritual. Even in my computer freezing up, I was like, oh, I see you. I see you. I see what's happening. Oh, see, the devil is a liar, as the old folks say. <laughs> devil, but I should say this to you. Okay, I'm getting ready to go. So I, I should say this to you in front of everybody. I want everybody to understand this. Um, You know, you're right. We have, I, we don't, I mean, I, we, don't, we don't think about this in terms of giving away or anything. Anything that is learned has to be shared. It doesn't do us any good. And so thank you because in building this space that will allow us to do so much more, we are living in a society where we're not in the society we want to live in. We got to build that society. And in transition to building that society, there are things that are this society is made of that we need. We need some petite maroonish. $99 for a year is a gift. And every one of those pennies goes into building that world. So right. as you go and get these people to join, understand that while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you, I, I'll speak just for myself. Just what Greg Carr is going to be doing. What for that $99? Not that that's even why you're doing it. What for that $99 do I have to do and do I want to do and that, that I will do to make what we do on Saturdays just look like a peak. And then you tell your friend, hey man, y'all got to come over here. Cause it, and you're gonna build it. So I wanna thank you, Karen, because that's not my Listen. gift. You, uh, you, you uh, can see the whole architect is the word, sis. And let me, let me say, you know, from thank a business you. standpoint, this is yes. not business because the amount mm. of time and work and energy, there is no amount of money. But that's what I wanna say too, you know, you, Got to charge something. I appreciate right. that. People pay a lot more for university uh, oh. education and they don't get nearly as much as we give on a Saturday. Nope. And I know that for a fact because I teach and you teach. Yes. I said, you know, the, the question has always been, can we build the world we want to live in? Can we build the kind of existence that is free and untethered from this system of oppression that we can be our black happy selves or whatever, you know, melanation you come into this world as, but where yes. we can truly start to engage in the kinds of conversations that can unearth all of the goodness that's in our DNA. Yes. And so this is the beginning. So yes. we're going to have birth pains and we're going to, you know, struggle through figuring out codes and, you know, uh, and this may not be the final destination. This may be just the beginning because as this thing grows, it's going to require everybody to pitch in. So the $99 is just the one thing, but now you got to go out and get more people because the more people, the more we can educate and the more we can do and the more folks we can bring out like Bavu. But I want to thank the team because again, oh. this has been, you know, kind of an evolution that started with you and I having these conversations on Saturday. Saturday, but has grown into something that I am humbled by that everybody on this team they don't ask for anything. Uh, as I said, Uraeus spent 70 out. So if you're watching the two, two and a half hour videos, because I left those for him. I did the early ones that were like 30 minutes and 20 minutes, but and my and it was still it still took forever. Ask for nothing and texting me middle of the night. I just finished episode 49. I'm like, okay, you know, and, and design and all of the things, Kareem and Donica, who's here on a Saturday, every Saturday and after Saturday and doing all of the little things that need to be done. And Carl, you know, who took on the the the, the challenge, because, again, I got a thousand things to do. We both teach full time. I got oh a God. radio show, um, you know, <laughs> managing. Yeah, I'm logging shows. off. It's doing another thing. Normally, normally I had to sit down for an hour. But uh, my friends at the Zen Education Project yeah. have a teacher, D.C. teachers uh, for social justice meeting in, in about t- 12 minutes. And I got to go over there and be very happy to go. But I'm just yeah. saying shout out to Zen Ed because the people around, the, they, but we were waiting for this, Karen. Thank you. We have been waiting for this place. Let me thank everybody who is watching right now because this couldn't happen without y'all. So again, it's a collective. This is a love journey. This is the 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 only thing I want to do in, for the rest of my life. Me too. And so, so I'm I'm me, grateful. Me too. A place where we can crazy, right? do this. Yeah, yeah. Y'all already know what this means, right? Everybody out there who has been. <laughs> Charging people to learn the whole model. 
That's yesterday. We ain't never going back. Trust. We ain't. Hear me. HBCU presidents. Uh oh. Provosts. <laughs> all you people out here who are or, or academics that write incredible books and then don't get down. We want all of you to come with us. And now we're going to find out whether the rhetoric you've been saying is actually true because this ain't about beating up nobody. We want everybody. But see, once you get everybody, now you find out whether you're for us or you're for yourself. Anybody for us? Come on, we want you. If you're for yourself, stay where you are. But understand that world is collapsing as we speak. Karen Hunter says, can I record this? Here we are almost a year late. Next week will be a year. Wow. will be a year. And here we are, y'all. Not at the end of a cycle, at the beginning. I love you, sis. I Thank love you, you so much. I love you too. <laughs> narrative, y'all. Narrative with a K. The K is silent like knowledge. Narrative.com. Check it out. What's the uh, code? Put it all in the uh in the uh description and go do your meeting, Dr. Carr. I appreciate it. What, what's, what's the code one more time? Oh, the code is our stories, capital O, capital S, all one word, jammed together. Our stories, capital O, capital S, as in Sam. Our stories. And how long? How long is the uh, is the code good for? We're gonna do it for. I, I think it's gonna be for a month, but I gotta meet with the team after this. Okay. Okay. Very like, good. But I'm so saying, we're gonna work out all of the details. Get it. Get it. Get in now. Yeah. All right. Love get you. In now. Love you. All right. See you later. <laughs>